Okay, looks like you have already started. Ah, I see. Hi, everybody. Всем привет. Buongiorno. Buonasera. Да, вроде. Какие еще есть языки? Just to test our chat, can you please just write anything to check if it works and if you hear me well, just any symbol or word us is okay. Yes, it looks positive. So I suggest to start maybe in, in one or two minutes. And besides, yes, you use this click meeting in combination with YouTube, right? So some people hear us and see, I assume, in YouTube. And yes, uh, the presenters of the session are, are here in the virtual room. Yes, I see some. Привет, hello. So, should we start? And uh, probably I should also open the YouTube channel just to see. Maybe some Channel. questions just to see. Okay, I see myself, uh, so I hope you also see me. Okay, so welcome to the International Conference of Software Testing, Machine Learning and Complex Process Analysis. And it's my pleasure yes, to start it. And welcome to Virtual Tomsk. It was my, my dream to, to see you here in Siberia, but unfortunately, due to this COVID restrictions, we will still we do have to move everything uh, online. We don't even have a hybrid format because we, in, in our city, the restrictions are quite high. So everyone uh, is in, in equal positions. Uh, so everyone's online and those who live in Tomsk and those who live quite far. But uh, okay, that's okay. So we have distributed geographically distributed conference. And uh, my experience of online events uh, says me that uh, probably we'll have also a synchronous uh, time asynchronous conference because many people will see uh, the presentations uh, later and we'll have this opportunity just to to see the recording and maybe they will contact you with questions after afterwards right so i i do believe that most important part of the co any research conference is coffee break and conference dinner <laughs> i unfortunately you have, don't have this opportunity uh, for, for this event, but the other part, namely presentations and question and answer sessions and opportunity to just to, to talk to the to the audience, to give, get feedback, to discuss uh, this, uh, this opportunity we do have here using our modern technologies. And I just encourage you to use it and just don't hesitate to ask any question directly in chat or maybe later write to to the, the speaker and also we have telegram channel with most of um, participants there and you can find or just ask someone directly there so just use all these channels and this will make our event the most useful the most um, efficient so and i also would like would like to introduce anna bogdan who is uh, the local organizing chair and, we'll, and she will also help me to to to, to lead this uh, to manage this this process. Anna, are you here? Can you say hi? Manage this process. Anna, are you here? Hello, I'm here. Yes. 
Okay. So uh, now I give you microphone to you. <laughs> okay. uh, hello. Hello. Thank yes. you very much. Okay. So uh, now I give microphone to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 yeah. YouTube because hello. the whole yes. thing. Okay. Uh, so uh, now I give microphone to you. I'm very okay. glad to see uh, you at uh, times uh, online, yes. <laughs> but. Uh, I'm very glad that our Tom's Technical University is uh, uh, now hosts uh, this conference, and uh, I would like to greet uh, all participants. And let me remind you uh, that we have time limits for presentations. Uh, for keynote speakers, it's about 15 minutes. Uh, for talks, uh, it's about uh, 20 minutes, uh, including questions. So let me introduce the first the first speaker. I'm sorry, technical problems. Mm. Um, hello, friends. I'm sorry. Uh, we have some technical problems. Now I'm returning. And uh, the first uh, speaker that I would like to introduce, it's uh, Alexey Hrashilov, lead researcher from Ivanikov Institute for System Programming of the Russian Academy of Science. Um, hello, Alexey. Are you here? Good morning. Good morning. So, um, Please, um, you have now microphone, and <laughs> I'm giving you this turn. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. And what do we have my slide, please? Yes, great. And today, uh, I would like uh, to share with you some of our experience in application of formal methods to software verification. And uh, <coughs> there are many domains uh, where uh, software plays very important roles from security perspective, from safety perspective. And uh, we definitely would like to have uh, no bugs in such software. And sometime uh, uh, we see an opinion that formal methods is a magical mathematical tool that can help us to achieve uh, such situation to achieve uh, software uh, software that have no any bugs if we look at this uh, more in more details uh, such magical tool have to guarantee that in all possible configurations in all possible input data with all possible interactions of our software with its environment and uh, with all possible uh, timings, preemptions, and other internal events, uh, the software behaves correctly. But uh, what does it mean from a mathematical point of view and how it's possible to apply mathematical methods to try to achieve to this goal? First of all, uh, to apply mathematical methods to software, we have to represent this software as a mathematical object. That means that we have, we have to build a model of this software. As the second item, we have to uh, represent a concept of software behaves correctly as a mathematical object. That means that we have to build a model of requirements to this software. And at the next step, we have to define what does it mean that two mathemat mathematical objects representing software uh, satisfies two requirements represented by corresponding mathematical object. 
and <coughs> when we uh, build such uh, mathematical objects and we have a definition of uh, uh, relationship between these classes of mathematical objects and we be can build uh, instances of these particular objects we have to pro prove that for these particular instances uh, we have a particular relation that means that our model of our software uh, satisfies to our model of requirements of course it uh, looks uh, uh, maybe quite a simple task but we have uh, some problems here and maybe the first problem is how to build a model of software maybe the second problem how to build uh, a model of requirements the third problem how to define uh, satisfy to relationship and uh, the fourth problem is uh, how to prove that we have such a relation of course it's maybe uh, uh, problems that uh, we have many uh, approaches to uh, solve but well, there are two uh, basic challenges that we have to uh, consider then we try to apply these techniques the first challenge is uh, uh, transition from uh, or building uh, models from uh, informal understanding of our requirements it is uh, a very unclear object in reality and it's a really complex task to build formal representation of these requirements. Uh, moreover, as uh, Mikhail Roman and Shurubura uh, said, transition from uh, informal to the formal is essentially informal. So this uh, transition ca cannot be uh, done in any formal way. <laughs> and that is a, a, a problem uh, especially when we have an, no clear understanding what is our requirements to our software of course in the areas which i mentioned before in areas we have where we apply uh, or develop software to safety critical areas uh, usually we have quite good uh, software development processes where uh, requirements to this software is developed uh in quite good way and as an example uh, i present here some statistics from our uh, projects uh, where we develop a real-time operating system for a civil avionics domain uh, that means that this operating system have to satisfy to requirements of uh, do 178c and um, uh, according to these uh, requirements we develop high level requirements to the operating system as a whole uh, we uh, decompose our operating system to small components and uh, for each of these components we develop uh, low level requirements and here you can see uh, some statistics that it, even high level requirements of, of for our operating system is more than 1000 pages and uh, it uh, consists of more than 1300 uh, elementary requirements and other and, and many other objects uh, that define a uh, concept and terms that is used in this uh, uh, requirements and for low level requirements uh, uh, numbers is uh, doubled but I have to mention here that we are in the process of the development of uh, low level requirements and expect that uh, it should be at least twice of a current status so that uh, transition uh, 
is uh, challenging for uh, even relatively small operating system where we have uh, only functions that really required to uh, achieve uh, need the needs of our uh, systems. And if we take a look on software that is developed for general purpose, and have to solve a lot of problems from uh, different domains like Linux kernel, uh, we can see that numbers of uh, uh, at least 1,000 uh, times more. At least you can see that uh, our operating system is uh, 20 uh, kilolines and the uh, Linux kernel is uh, 21 million lines. And the uh, same we can see for our uh, industrial projects as well. Uh, what mitigations can be uh, applied to try to solve this uh, challenge? Uh, one possible approach that is often used is to formalize only simple properties uh, that can be easily uh, checked by experts. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh, it uh, uh, can help to make sure that a formal model of our requirements uh, doesn't contain bugs itself. Because when we have so uh, complex systems with so uh, complex requirements and try to formalize these requirements, we uh, have to be sure that uh, this formal model will have bugs as well. Uh, another possible approach uh, when apply formal method techniques is to avoid requirements at all because this problem is or building this requirements is too complex. And the check only uh, absence of some typical bugs in the code uh, that uh, <laughs> we have in for our system, like uh, checking uh, safety properties uh, working with memory, uh, checking assertions and things like that. And uh, if we work with complete specification of our model, of course, we can try to apply uh, formal methods to check some internal consistency of our models uh, to, of requirements uh, and uh, uh, try to review this model by experts. And of course, when we check our model of requirements against implementation, we also can find a lot of bugs in uh, a model of requirements. So, the second challenge uh, that we have is complexity of uh, system under analysis. And if we look just on uh, one uh, system on call graph on one system call from Linux kernel, uh, it's uh, it's an unrealistically to understand all these dependencies uh, in without significant efforts. And uh, even uh, if we take a look at requirements to our small real-time operating system, uh, we could see that many of them uh, refer to some algorithms uh, or that have quite complex uh, structure. And uh, even if, if this requirement is an elementary one, that is say that in particular situation, uh, operating system have to do something, it's usually referred to some of uh, algorithms describing the, that it means. And as you can see, uh, in many cases that algorithms are complex as well. The main 
mitigation that they have to cope with uh, the pro this problem of complexity uh, is abstraction. Of course, that means that we try to uh, simplify uh, the system to try to ignore irrelevant details and uh, uh, try to focus on really important and central properties of <coughs> our system. And now let me uh, look at uh, some patterns that we see in our practice, how these uh, challenges are uh, considered in uh, projects where formal methods are applied to uh, some practical tasks. The first pattern which I would like to mention is uh, uh, an approach with, uh, where both models, software model and requirement model is built by experts. Uh, and after that, some of approaches uh, like deductive verification or model checking are applied to uh, prove that uh, model builds by expert uh, are in satisfied to relationship. Uh, <coughs> of course, uh, for uh, proving uh, that we have such relationship, various uh, technique can be applied. Model checking or deductive verification uh, model checking can uh, be applied fully automatically, and uh, uh, that makes this approach very uh, <coughs> attractive. But of course, uh, in this case, we have a problem that any incremental change in uh, software or maybe in requirement model uh, can uh, lead to situation where the tool uh, cannot uh, handle such uh, complex uh, model and uh, we have no fallback how to uh, help a uh, tool to uh, solve uh, this task uh, with this technique. For deductive verification techniques uh, where a manual decomposition usually used in terms of definition of um, uh, invariance or some other approaches. In that case, of, uh, of course, a lot of automation is used to discharge uh, verification conditions that are usually generated with these techniques. And uh, in these cases, uh, we typically have a full break. Uh, approach when automatic tools uh, like SMT solvers cannot prove some theorems automatically. In that case, they can try to do it in interactive theorem proofs, um, proofs but of course, it's <coughs> not very pleasant task to do. And uh, looking at this, we can <coughs> see here that uh, we could uh, have a good confidence with these approaches. Uh, of course, keeping in mind that in both models, model of software and model of requirements is built uh, manually, uh, but because of this uh, step, uh, this model can be quite simple and they can represent really important details. They have good abstraction, but uh, otherwise, if we assume that experts uh, done their work uh, correctly, they get a good confidence that uh, analyzed properties are <coughs> proved in, on top of these models. And uh, uh, up to this manual step, uh, they are represented in the system under analysis. If we look at the second pattern that the see in the practice is a approach uh, that we do, uh, usually call a software deductive verification. In this case, uh, a model 
of uh, software and analysis is built automatically from source code of a binary code of our software. And for this automatically built model, we try to uh, prove that it satisfy manual written requirements in uh, uh, some form. Uh, in this case, uh, we usually look at software uh, as a white box, we see uh, particular functions and uh, define uh, for each function uh, co contracts, uh, usually with help of precondition or postcondition, uh, and uh, uh, define loop invariance uh, as a step uh, helping our tools to prove that uh, source code that we have as implementation uh, on all possible paths satisfy to uh, the model of our requirements representing in terms of precondition and postcondition. And that means that uh, we try to prove that if function is called with parameters and uh, in the state of the system that satisfy preconditions uh, on all possible paths when function uh, finishes its work, uh, we will have a, a system of our state and uh, output parameters that satisfy to our post condition. Here, uh, we uh, also have uh, a lot of automation that can help us to discharge um, generated verification conditions for our uh, functions. And uh, here, uh, we also have the same problem as deductive verification on top of models that uh, uh, if uh, some T-solvers can, or some other tools that we apply to automatically prove that uh, verification conditions, uh, we have a potential fallback to prove uh, verification conditions that are too complex for the tools uh, manually using interactive theorem proven, uh, provers, but um, in, in practice it's uh, uh, even more complex task because a uh, mo model of software automatically generated by other tools requires uh, quite deep understanding by experts that try to prove its properties and that's not a simple task. But nevertheless, uh, this approach uh, can provide very good confidence of in the result that we prove that our uh, software satisfied to our to the model of requirements that we define in terms of preconditions, postconditions. Of course, this confidence is up to some assumptions uh, that we have. Uh, for example, uh, we assume that uh, a compiler that built uh, a machine code from scores, source code we have analyzed uh, behaves correctly. And in particular, uh, it satisfies to a uh, model of uh, computation that we use in our verification tool. And now of assumption that we often have when apply these approaches is an assumption that, uh, for example, have limited parallelism or even proof behavior of uh, correctness of behavior of our functions uh, and the assumption that it's a sequential execution. And of course, uh, this approach have a significant drawback uh, because it requires a lot of manual efforts of very uh, well-educated experts. And uh, as a result, uh, this have a very uh, significant cost. And theoretically, uh, the scope of application of these uh, techniques uh, is quite big. Uh, we can take quite big s software and uh, pr define contracts for each 
uh, function in this software and try to uh, prove uh, uh, that source code satisfies these uh, requirements. And uh, in particular, we uh, prove uh, when we prove uh, requirements for one particular function, we have to use requirements that we uh, apply to a function that we call from uh, the current one. But uh, realistically, the scope of application is limited by the very big cost of this process. Now, uh, let me take a look at the third pattern. And that pattern is uh, uh, software model chicken, an approach when we apply, we also build a model of software automatically. But when we apply model chicken, techniques to prove that this model uh, satisfy to requirements. As far as the model checking tools have to uh, uh, analyze uh, this property fully automatically, uh, it's often uh, and the, as we uh, discussed before is have to apply uh, some kind of abstraction automatically uh, during this process. Uh, in this case, it's usually uh, can be applied only to simplified properties uh, nor, and cannot be used to uh, prove uh, that a model of our software satisfy to uh, full functional requirements. And uh, the problems that uh, they have here that uh, this approach is uh, limited by complexity of code and requirements. Uh, yeah. But uh, at the same time, uh, it uh, works mostly automatically, so it requires much less manual efforts. And as soon as it consider our software under, uh, on detail level, it provides us a good confidence in the results. But of course, there are uh, assumptions uh, that still uh, should be applied because uh, verification tool for also usually consider uh, software uh, working without or with some limited parallelism and, and with some other uh, simplifications. And uh, finally, uh, let's consider the fourth pattern that we have. And uh, in this pattern, uh, we switch uh, from analysis of a full model of software uh, using formal methods. Uh, in this case, we uh, uh, execute our software on some particular test cases and uh, uh, collect execution trace for uh, such uh, uh, test, tests. And when we build a mathematical ob object representing this execution trace and analyze only this uh, object of representing uh, this trace, uh, against a requirements model. As uh, we can see, uh, of course, uh, uh, such uh, mo models are m much more simple because we describe just one particular trace of execution, not uh, all possible traces. And uh, it can be solved much more efficiently with uh, uh, the tools that we have. <coughs> so, uh, in most cases, this uh, uh, checks is uh, executed fully automatically. So, no any manual uh, invention required. That means that we can uh, generate a lot of test cases and uh, uh, check and then uh, check that uh, in these uh, test cases, uh, we, we, 
behavior of system under analysis that we observed satisfied to the model of requirements that we have. <laughs> and of course, uh, when we uh, generate, we have to build these uh, test cases, we can uh, prepare this uh, well uh, manually, or we can try to uh, apply various techniques to generate uh, these test cases from some models, and in particular from the same requirements model that we use to uh, check uh, correctness of the behavior of a system at a test. And this approach, of course, uh, have uh, uh, much less confidence in the result because we definitely analyze our software only on uh, particular execution paths, not on all possible paths. But at the same time, it requires much less efforts and uh, it can be uh, applied even uh, for very complex uh, systems uh, that where uh, application of uh, uh, models representing the whole system is uh, <coughs> completely unrealistic. And now, uh, let's take uh, a look on this uh, 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 patterns uh, from the uh, perspective of uh, results that it provides. So deductive verification and model checking uh, can be applied uh, with uh, manual uh, building of uh, uh, models or sort of automatic uh, building of models. In both cases, it provides quite good confidence, uh, but uh, doctor verification in both cases have uh, uh, big requirements to manual efforts uh, um, to be used, but uh, at the same time, it can be applied to uh, cover uh, to prove properties of uh, quite big systems, and it's usually uh, limited by cost of uh, application, not by uh, uh, tool uh, limitations. Model checking uh, also have good code of confidence, and but it uh, can be applied much more automatically, so it have. Uh, less requirements to experts in terms of applications, of course, then uh, that doesn't mean then, uh, that a problem of uh, building a model of requirements is uh, solved automatically. But the main problem of model checking techniques is uh, uh, a limited uh, uh, complexity of uh, <coughs> Code that it can be handled uh, uh, automatically, and the absence of fallback when the tool uh, cannot solve a problem uh, after some incremental improvements or adding some uh, small uh, additional elements to system under analysis. And finally, uh, runtime verification techniques where we switch from analysis of uh, uh, all possible paths to analysis of uh, system under test on particular uh, test cases. It has uh, much less confidence, but it has require much less efforts and uh, have almost unlimited complexity uh, of system under test. And uh, if we uh, look uh, about uh, some real examples of applications of these techniques uh, and these patterns uh, in our practice, uh, uh, I try to summarize some of uh, projects uh, where we uh, see these patterns and uh, actually try to apply all these approaches uh, to uh, operating systems and uh, most of 
first of all to Linux kernel as a, a industrial software that a good target for application of formal methods and these techniques and all these activities we do uh, in, within the Linux verification center uh, founded uh, more than 15 years ago in our institute and we have a number uh, uh, projects where we try to apply advanced uh, verification techniques and formal methods to uh, Linux software. And first uh, <coughs> project that we start uh, in 2009 was a uh, model based testing that uh, follows uh, to uh, <coughs> pattern number four that we uh, considered before. In this uh, project, uh, our target was uh, uh, Linux uh, uh, binary interface described in Linux standard base specification, uh, and uh, where we uh, analyze all uh, these. Uh, uh, requirements. Uh, in particular, we built a catalog of all requirements applicable to uh, Linux kernel, uh, Linux standard base core uh, that uh, specify requirements to 1,050 uh, interfaces. And most of these interfaces are uh, referred to POSIX specifications and catalog of uh, requirements extracted uh, from for these interfaces consists uh, more than uh, 20,000 uh, of elementary requirements. And uh, during this uh, building of requirements uh, and on the second step, uh, building a formal model of these uh, requirements, uh, we uh, of course, find a, a number of deficiencies in the specifications. Almost 100 of them were reported and fixed in LSB and POSIX. And uh, uh, more than uh, 80 bugs were reported in distributions uh, and uh, <coughs> fixed during this project. And if we look at the architecture of this approach, uh, in this case, we have specification that described requirements to uh, uh, interfaces uh, uh, that were represented as C functions, and they use our specification extension of C programming language uh, to describe requirements uh, in a formal model. And this specification, though, uh, used as a source for to generate uh, C code. Uh, that uh, represent, uh, that solve a problem of uh, uh, checking uh, traces against of uh, uh, a model of requirements. And uh, also on top of this model, we also built uh, test scenarios and uh, some uh, that uh, help us to automatically uh, build a sequence of test uh, steps uh, in <coughs> where each particular test step were described manually uh, by test designer. And uh, uh, if we look at this experience, uh, basically they can say that um, model-based uh, testing approach allows us to achieve uh, better quality of uh, test suite that we built against the uh, approach when we try to uh, build such uh, test suite by manual definition of uh, test cases with some uh, classical techniques and uh, <coughs> uh, also uh, it's uh, easy to maintain such uh, uh, test suite because uh, we have less duplication but of course uh, that works only if we have very smart uh, test engineers that 
uh, have very good mathematical background uh, and uh, it's not realistically to expect to work uh, well in classical uh, uh, situations where test engineers are not uh, uh, programmers in sophisticated uh, sophisticated knowledge and especially not uh, experts in mathematical uh, techniques <laughs> as a, an, another example uh, let me uh, point to our Linux drive verification program uh, where we apply the third pattern the pattern where we software software model checking tools are used uh, we uh, uh, and uh, as far as software model checking techniques is used when we build a model of a system of our software automatically, but uh, 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 we try to prove absence of uh, typical bugs in the, uh, the software under analysis. And uh, in, in that case, uh, when we start this project, we decide to analyze what kind of typical bugs in Linux kernel uh, we have, and we analyze uh, all commits for one year in stable uh, branch of Linux kernel and build the taxonomy of typical bugs. Uh, and we can see here that uh, most of them can be represented as uh, reachability problems. Uh, some of them also can be represented as reachability, but uh, very closely related to memory model of uh, C programs, uh, where and, and where we apply some uh, modification of uh, cl uh, classical reachability model checkers based on uh, symbolic memory graphs, and for. Uh, the last categories of synchronization problems, and especially for data races, we will need to develop some special tools also based on uh, the same ideas. As far as I have no time today to go into details, I'll just briefly mention that as a, a main engine for software model checking, we use a CPA checker tool that is developed uh, uh, originally uh, by a uh, team of Dirk Beer from uh, University of Passau and now University of um, uh, Munich. And uh, we participate and contribute to this tool as well. And in particular, we develop SMG uh, techniques uh, there and uh, more complex memory model for that, that <coughs> can represent uh, complexity of Linux kernel code. Uh, also, data race tool was developed by our uh, team and uh, uh, in addition to be able to apply software model checking uh, engine that is a uh, CPA checker uh, we have to build uh, a lot of tooling that uh, help us to extract some uh, modules of Linux kernel loadable modules build model of environment for that modules and uh, uh, only for such uh, relatively s small pieces uh, that up to 10,000 kill lines uh, try to apply software ML checking to find uh, bugs, uh, typical bugs in the uh, Linux drivers. <coughs> and uh, uh, so I, I mentioned uh, we partition uh, hook, uh, the rebig Linux kernel to elements. Uh, by border of uh, uh, a natural concept for Linux kernel that is uh, loadable kernel modules. Uh, and uh, we have to uh, in de <coughs> uh, define environment model for such uh, uh, pieces of C code because we have no main function as a software model checking tool usually expect we have quite sophisticated uh, approach with registration of callbacks that then you called from Linux kernel uh, after this registration 
So we have to emulate <coughs> environment uh, of uh, device driver uh, that uh, simulate uh, how Linux kernel work with, with device drivers. Uh, but in our case, it's uh, a model of these environments that is suitable for uh, verification tool. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, it have to represent uh, on the real uh, interaction of uh, code under analysis with uh, uh, the kernel core. So we have to keep in mind some order limitation uh, of function call, some implicit limitations <coughs> on uh, output uh, parameters that we have. Uh, so it, it requires some uh, also quite uh, uh, manual efforts to describe uh, such uh, active driver environment models that have to be uh, complete, but at the same time correct. And also they have to be simple enough uh, to, uh, so our uh, current uh, software model checking tools can handle uh, the, co the code uh, that we will have because if we build too complex uh, too precise environment model uh, we could have uh, big problems with uh, <coughs> application the tools we will just have too many uh, timeouts and this uh, project works uh, for well, maybe eight years and uh, for during these years we found uh, many real bugs and more than 200 uh, sorry 400 of bugs were already fixed in linux kernel during this project and uh, so it uh, works as uh, a bug uh, finding tool quite well but uh, of course uh, it's uh, not so not not yet so good in proven absence of the bugs uh, of even of bugs of particular kind of this uh, in this code and as far as I have to small time uh, I just briefly mentioned that we also have a deductive verification of operating systems uh, program where we apply a first and uh, second pattern when we uh, <coughs> try uh, to prove with uh, deductive uh, verification uh, approaches uh, some properties of manually uh, built uh, model of uh, uh, access control system uh, that we have in uh, <coughs> Linux kernel of our uh, partners. Uh, and uh, we use event B uh, uh, language to represent this model and use a Rodian framework to prove properties. I have here some statistics for event B code and event B models for two of our uh, models for access control that we have here. Uh, and also for Aster Linux, we also try to prove uh, uh, correctness of a uh, uh, code that implements uh, LSM uh, using our uh, deductive verification uh, techniques and also uh, of course these results are proprietary because the code that we have analyzed is proprietary for our partners but uh, at the bottom of our slide uh, we have here a link to uh, our uh, project where we apply the same tools and the same techniques to some uh, simple library functions from Linux kernel and uh, these results are uh, open source and publicly available. <coughs> A problem that I have here uh, that uh, kernel code is very low level uh, and have complexity that uh, exists in a deductive verification tool for C programming language uh, were not able to handle, uh, like container of arithmetics and reinterpretation cast and things like that. So we have to uh, build a fork of uh, uh, from a C Y3 
uh, and JC a plugin uh, framework that we call uh, Astraver framework. And uh, all these uh, tools are publicly available as open source <coughs> from uh, our sites. Uh, I think I will not uh, go into details of uh, some industry applications uh, that I mentioned here <coughs> and uh, try to conclude. Uh, so if we look at the uh, basic idea that uh, formal methods is a magical mathematical tool that help us to avoid any bugs in our software, of course, it's not uh, the case that we have. <coughs> uh, we have a number of challenges, but uh, anyway, uh, we have to, when we try to apply uh, these techniques, we have to uh, take some decision against trade-off between confidence that we would like to achieve and between uh, size of uh, court and the complexity of the problems that we have uh, and that feasible for particular techniques that we can apply and between the cost uh, of uh, application of these techniques. But nevertheless, uh, <coughs> we can see that formal methods can be successfully applied and various levels and uh, of uh, uh, confidence that we uh, can achieve and the uh, uh, efforts that we can uh, put on this uh, increase of confidence. Uh, we cannot guarantee absence of all possible bugs, of course, using these techniques, but we can uh, try to guarantee absence of uh, particular kind of bugs, of course, under some assumptions. <coughs> and Finally, uh, anyway, uh, we can see that formal methods provides a very valuable approach to increase our confidence in system reliability. Uh, that's very important for safety critical, security critical systems. And of course, it cannot uh, achieve a full uh, <laughs> idea of uh, absence of bugs at all. Uh, and uh, also, uh, it, when we try to prove absence of typical bugs and some safety properties, we can do it with uh, <coughs> reasonable efforts because we don't need to uh, develop manually specifications. Uh, and of course, uh, this approach is uh, limited in confidence. Uh, and the limited in size, of course, uh, where it can be applied, but at least uh, it uh, <coughs> can be uh, applied with uh, uh, feasible efforts. If we uh, try to uh, develop full-fledged formal specification of requirements, that's a very complex task itself. But at the same time, we have to mention and a lot of uh, discussions for <coughs> the results that uh, approve this uh, is that uh, this uh, and try to develop formal specification of requirements is itself very valuable uh, approach. And uh, it's even more valuable than uh, formal verification that follows that uh, <coughs> formalization uh, step. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, deductive verification can be applied uh, with, uh, with and provide very good confidence, uh, but can be very expensive. And at, uh, our side, runtime verification can have moderate cost, but with limited uh, confidence. And uh, as far as I have no time anymore, uh, let me say thank you for your attention. And uh, 
I will be happy to answer on your questions. Uh, and Ale yes, bye. Alexei, thank you very much. Yes, we have uh, questions from our participants. Um, what technology, technology stack do you use for automated testing? Uh, so uh, we use uh, unit task uh, uh, technique technology that uh, is model based te technology uh, uh, where we uh, use uh, specification extension of programming languages uh, C programming language for example uh, to describe requirements and uh, our tools uh, to, to uh, generate automatically oracles that check uh, trace against uh, formal model of requirements and some our engines that automate uh, generation of test cases. Thank you. Um, and the next question, how to certify a proof? Uh, it's a, a good uh, problem and a good uh, <coughs> Situation to discuss uh, because it's definitely one of uh, assumptions that we have and uh, that I didn't mention is assumption that our verification tool is correct and uh, <coughs> uh, there are uh, approaches that is uh, discussed and uh, uh, tried to apply it in our project as well one of these possible approaches is to generate a witness uh, during verification that means it's another mathematical object that can be uh, used uh, by independent verification tool uh, to recheck verification and the idea is uh, when uh, we have a witness a kind of uh, proof uh, written uh, in a formal way uh, our tool uh, can be more simple because it don't try to build uh, a proof by itself it just check that a witness that represent proof uh, is a correct proof and the, as far as this uh, tool is developed independently and there are uh, several of them at least can be uh, developed uh, we can increase confidence in uh, uh, correctness of our proof and these particular techniques are applied in software model checking and uh, in sv comp uh, competition for software model checkers where I applied uh, in uh, this competition as a part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, the, next, the next question. Uh, great talk. <laughs> Thanks. Um, from our participants and from me also. Uh, what are the advantages of the deductive verification approach? I mean comparing to model checking, SPIN, PROMELA, kind of the error localization problem and so on? Uh, I would say that the main uh, advantage of uh, deductive verification is against model checking that it's uh, uh, more uh, sustainable, more uh, so in model checking the uh, can have a situation then we have a model uh, that we check the properties and that works well <coughs> but uh, when we add some small improvements to our call code of model uh, and the tool uh, after that uh, cannot uh, handle uh, model it go to timeout and they cannot do anything with that uh, and uh, in deductive verification mostly we have to an approach with manual uh, interaction with the tool and providing some uh, hints to it and uh, to uh, solve even uh, very complex uh, models of so as a result deductive verification have uh, much more requirements to manual efforts from experts uh, but as far as uh, uh, we, it cannot uh, uh, get a situation that we have no result at all, we usually prefer to use deductive verification because we don't want to be in situation then we cannot get any result on a model checker. 
in, in the middle of our project. Thank you. Um, what language do you use for requirements specification? Uh, actually, it depends on a project. Uh, for uh, testing we, uh, projects, we usually use the specification extension of C programming language that we had <coughs> developed by ourselves. For deductive verification, we use a CSL uh, and CC specification language that was developed by uh, from a C developers. Uh, for abstract models, we used Event B uh, as a language for description. And another interesting uh, direction that I didn't mention in the talk uh, is uh, how we describe our model for our real time operating system, our requirements. Uh, and we don't develop formal model yet uh, to this uh, operating system. But we have to develop uh, requirements written in natural language. Uh, and the statistics of that requirements are, are were presented. It's more than thousands uh, of pages and things like that. But internally, we used some uh, language for semi-formal representation of these requirements. Uh, and uh, after that, we generate text in natural language for that from this semi-formal model. And uh, this semi-formal model is a uh, uh, first step uh, to full formal model of uh, requirements to our system. And in this case, we use a RECA language that is uh, developed uh, during this project in our institute. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And uh, a little remark uh, from our participant. Uh, the dynamic verification term is better than routine verification. Uh, routine verification is more about runtime, for example, during the execution, monitoring. So, do you agree? Um, yes, uh, thank you for, for the note. Uh, it's reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, there are no questions. Uh, Can I use my uh, to microphone just to ask another question? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, Can you show the slide with a summary of different methods? Do, do you still have it? Um, I think it's the last one, maybe last, but not before, before, before. Next, 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 next. next. No, this is just summary for three approaches. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was before examples, I guess. Yes, 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 before examples. So, and my my question was about um, uh, turning uh, quality into quantity. Yes, this one. Yes, yes. You see, you, you mean that some kind of good confidence, uh, sacrificed confidence, big effort, small effort. Is there any way to measure? this difference like confidence like here 99 percent and here like 82.5 and here just 541 <laughs> or something like that just to, to turn it into the numbers do, do you have any idea uh, i think that we can uh, turn it to some numbers but uh, I, I don't uh, think that it's a good idea because it's uh, um, I, I don't expect that these uh, numbers could be uh, reasonable. Okay, so it's more like your feeling, more or less. Like, but again, it, some and some yes, uh, okay. and they also see okay. word cost. But cost is usually yes. about numbers, like like of million course. dollars. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, uh, there are uh, numbers that can be applied to, uh, in reasonable way to some of uh, aspects. For example, size of court. Mm -hmm. uh, or number of uh, uh, dollars uh, that we have to spend on this particular project. But of course, also there are many other aspects. For example, uh, according to our experience, size in terms of source code numbers, it's not the most important uh, element. Even uh, small function if it contains some complex uh, constructions and complex uh, loops for example uh, cannot be handled by, soft, by our tools but uh, much bigger uh, modules uh, with more simple code 
uh, uh, can be handled successfully. And uh, about dollars, so it's actually also there are many aspects that we have to keep in mind about expertise of uh, the team, uh, actually uh, time uh, and uh, uh, spent before start of a project in uh, development of a team and things like that. Okay, okay, I see. And uh, one more question, which I will try to ask probably every speaker. So our uh, conference is organized by university, and I uh, assume that some students are watching your presentation. So typical question is how uh, how how difficult is the learning core curve? For example, some second, maybe third degree student is interested in this topic. How much time would it take for him or her to just get into the subject? And would you recommend maybe some online course or maybe a textbook for this? That, that probably would be a good point for every speaker, just to mention something like that. Uh, actually, uh, we have co uh, quite big experience in uh, introduction of all these techniques to our students because we work with students a lot mm -hmm. uh, during our work. Uh, maybe it's too difficult to point to some particular courses because for different directions uh, there are different uh, uh, of them, but uh, maybe uh, some uh, methodical materials is present on our site mm -hmm. uh, and can be uh, referred. Okay, we got a signal from next speaker. <laughs> okay, thank you again, Alexei. Uh, thank you. Nice presentation, thank you nice discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alexei. And uh, the next speaker is Dmitry Kalpashikov, engineer at Tomsk Polytechnic University. Uh, so, uh, I can. Uh, Give me a moment. Uh, uh, the presentation uh, looks fine. I don't exactly show sure that it is. Um, okay. Uh, good day. My name is uh, Dmitry Kalbashkov, and I would like to present uh, work and investigation of the capabilities of the of neo artificial neural networks in problem of classifying objects with dynamic features. Uh, so our work is uh, dedicated to forest fires. Uh, it is, uh, in modern world, it is a significant problem. It is a significant problem that causes a lot of uh, damage to both civil nature and humans. Uh, it is important to early detect uh, fire and uh, to take timely measures to stop it. There is a several ways to do that, it, but all of them require a lot of human staff that force it to do a boring and uh, monotonous job. The other way to detect this fire it is use object detection. However, it is it is have uh, some problems. The smoke don't have any constant shape and color. Uh, it is uh, very depend on source. Uh, uh, and the distance between camera and fire source, it will really depend on uh, time of the day, the weather condition, and there is a sometimes low climb cloud that could be recognized as smoke. Uh, there you can see a cloud that, that, that low flying clouds. So, uh, our, uh, as I say, our work is dedicated to uh, detect this, that smoke. But uh, we, we use a video segments to detect the smoke. We, at first, we extract uh, some dynamic features, use object detection to detect some, to define some objects that would be a smoke, and then we classify this object. Uh, and is this place is a classification object. Uh, so we investigate the methods that could be used to classify this object with dynamic features. Uh, so the first step is frame preprocessing. As you can see, we just subtract, uh, take some frames from video sequence and subtract it. 
to see some this uh, dynamic feature map. Uh, then we use simple object detection on that dynamic feature map. That shows us if there is smoke objects, if there is object that could be considered as smoke or not. Uh, as you can see, we have we sometimes have uh, object detections that use only single plane can sometimes uh, detect landmarks as smoke, or it could uh, see some object in the sky as uh, smoke when it uh, could be a cloud. So uh, detection by single frame it is not as efficient as it could be. Uh, to improve its result, we can use uh, several images to uh, sequence of images to uh, define if, it, if it's if we have a uh, small cloud. So we have uh, several ways to do it. At first, we can uh, use just uh, we can extract several frames from sequence and uh, classify it separately and then combine its predictions. Or we can use uh, recur recurrent neural networks that use several frames at the same time that uh, to define our object. So as you can see here, we already uh, we uh, compare several two recurrent neural networks, GRU and LSTM neural networks and fully connected neural networks. As you can see, uh, accuracy of LSTM neural networks is best uh, show best results and the other uh, recurrent neural network also show good result in compared with convolutional neural network. Uh, so here we you can see we do some research uh, about uh, fine tuning of our recurrent neural network as, and it, as you can see, the best result it, it show very good result with accuracy is eighty five eighty five percent, which is quite good results. <coughs> and, and so you can see in this slide the uh, work of our uh, dynamic feature classification. There you can see uh, objects that defined by. Uh, single frame, uh, single frame object detection. That and that and the uh, right side is the uh, object with what what uh, what is classified as smoke by our uh, dynamic object classification. And that's all. I have a very short presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, Dmitry, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Now we are waiting for uh, for questions. Uh, can I ask you? Yes. Meanwhile, uh, so did you implement it on some real uh, real application, or is it just research prospect? Uh, well, yes, this system is uh, already working in uh, Kaliningrad region, and it's. Uh, well, find uh, some good result, and we also uh, verify our system on uh, a lot of uh, sources from the a lot of free sources like. Uh, well, yeah. And also, so, you, you mentioned you... in the beginning that indeed uh, all these algorithms heavily depend on weather conditions and season, etc. And what are restrictions for your algorithm? Does it work during the evening, morning, uh, cloud? Fog, whatever. Well, it is uh, weather restriction. It is uh, shouldn't be obviously. It it uh, <coughs> this is proposed to day. Uh, mm -hmm. There is obviously shouldn't be such things as smoke, and it have some restriction on time because uh, camera uh, when camera works, it's rotate from uh, several. Uh, for example, uh, ca camera sh should rotate. Uh, once per, for example, 10 seconds. So algorithm should process video segments from that time to proceed to next video. Okay, I see. Okay. Uh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. We have 
uh, one more question. Uh, one more question and uh, the second question. Uh, so, did you train model by yourself or got some pre-trained for smoke detection network? Uh, we use we train model by ourselves. We use uh, inception veterinary network as uh, we use efficient data as object classifier. Object uh, there is no we don't use somebody for training for smoke or neural network. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. uh, one comment. Um, I guess it depends on the quality of video camera as well. Yes, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, Dmitri, thank you very much. If uh, we have no questions, so please um, uh, thank you again, and I hope we uh, we see you soon at our university. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. And the next speaker, Mikhail Lebedev, uh, from Ivanikov Institute for System Programming of Russian Academy of Science. Mikhail. Yes, hello. Hello. So, so let's restart. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, hello, my name is uh, Mikhail Lebedev, and I would like to present you uh, our research of uh, open source tools for neural network inference. So I'll start with a small introduction and background. So I think uh, many of you know that uh, uh, the development of hardware uh, is a time and resource consuming process. Uh, so many some people uh, try to use uh, synthesis to ease and uh, accelerate this process. Uh, synthesis is uh, uh, on the process of uh, transforming some uh, high-level behavioral model into uh, the low-level hardware model in, uh, well, it's actually usually it's an RTL model, which can later be transformed into an ASIC or an FPGA bit stream. Uh, we can divide um, uh, synthesis into three levels. Uh, the most uh, highest level is obviously the high level synthesis, then uh, goes the so-called middle level synthesis and the lowest level is uh, hardware construction. So, some words about these levels. Well, uh, as I have said, uh, the hardware construction level is the lowest. On this level, uh, the input model uh, represents uh, uh, the system and uh, low-level architecture. Uh, there are many hardware details, and actually this uh, level is usually very close to uh, RTL development. On this level, uh, such languages as Chisel and BlueSpec are usually used. Uh, so the next level is uh, the middle level. Uh, here, uh, uh, the input model usually represents the overall system architecture and maybe some hardware details, but uh, low level details are omitted usually. And the most abstract level is uh, the high level. So there we uh, can provide uh, no uh, architecture details or hardware details, only uh, the algorithm, uh, some behavioral, abstract behavioral model uh, written in uh, usual uh, languages like C++, Python, and others. And here, uh, there are many domain-specific languages, for example, to 
describe uh, neural networks. So not only me, uh, our team uh, has uh, conducted uh, research on high-level synthesis uh, this year. We have um, uh, reviewed uh, several, th uh, several hundred articles, patents, uh, and uh, found uh, over 50 open source tools. And only 12 of uh, these tools uh, were good enough for evaluation. So we have evaluated these uh, tools using four tasks, uh, three algorithms, and uh, uh, the part that I'm presenting, uh, some neural network models. So, uh, our main uh, question was if we could use uh, open source tools for uh hardware synthesis so let's start with uh the neural network part first of all um i would like to say some words about uh the neural network formats which are used in uh, uh, different tools nowadays uh, the most popular uh, formats are Oinix, TensorFlow, and Keras. So we have used these uh, formats in our evaluation part. Um, the other formats uh, are not so usual. Well, so on this, in this table, you can see uh, the tools that we have uh, reviewed. Uh, these tools are very different. They are developed developed by uh, big and small companies, uh, universities, and even uh, some people. Uh, we can uh, divide these tools into three groups. Uh, the first group consists of uh, the tools which run inference of neural networks on uh, the fixed architectures like CPUs, uh, GPUs, and uh, tensor processors, and others. Uh, the second group are the tools that um, uh, use uh, specialized uh, coprocessor cores to run neural networks and this course can be uh, programmed into the FPGA or maybe some hardware. And uh, the last group consists of the tools that are that can uh, synthesize RTL directly or using some conventional high-level synthesis tools like uh, LegUp or Vivado. So our goal here was to implement uh, our neural, neural network models on uh, the FPGAs. Uh, so, so that's why we have chosen uh, the tools uh, from the second and the third group. So here you can see our uh, evaluation models. This, uh, very small models of uh, the neural networks. Uh, this is because uh, we uh, don't have big FPGAs. We used uh, small, uh, the small ones. Uh, I'll uh, talk about this later. So the first two models are the neural networks, uh, which uh, 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 which can recognize uh, uh, the digits from the NIST data set. Uh, the first uh, network is uh, fully connected and the second network is a convolutional neural network. And the last group of uh, models, uh, these models are synthetic matrix multiplication, which we used to evalu evaluate uh, the left load tool. So you, here you can see our environment. We've, we've had uh, three 
development boards, two based on uh, Intel Cyclone 5 uh, system on a chip, and one uh, based on Xilinx uh, Zinc 7000 uh, system on a chip. We have also run inference on the Intel Core i7 CPU and NVIDIA GPU. Uh, here I should note that um, we have used uh, the default settings of the tools. So we have not adjusted uh, our uh, these tools to our models. So next we have, uh, I'll say uh, some words about the results. Uh, only two open source tools uh, have managed to uh, run our examples on FPGAs. Uh, the first one is uh, TVM tool plus uh, versatile tensor accelerator coprocessor core. And the second tool is a uh, left flow tool, but uh, it, haven't, it, it hasn't managed to uh, synthesize uh, the convolutional neural network. Uh, the other tools uh, have failed on, but uh, because of different uh, reasons like uh, errors, uh, licensing problems, or some closed implementations. So I would like to uh, talk more about uh, the tools that succeeded. So the first one is uh, Leflow. Uh, this tool has been developed in the University of British Columbia. It is not only the tool, but also a root of synthesis. So here you can see uh, the input TensorFlow model is compiled um, by the XLA compiler, which is a part of uh, the TensorFlow framework. Uh, then um, uh, the LLVM uh, model of the input neural network is uh, transformed by the Leflow tool, which uh, transforms um, it into a more hardware style uh, model. It adds some additional variables, signals, and uh, then this uh, transformed model is uh, synthesized uh, by the uh, GAP synthesis tool into the Verilog model. So here you can see uh, the resource usage of uh, the synthesized designs, the models, uh, and also uh, the RTL uh, code size and the maximum frequency of uh, the synthesized designs. On the next slide, uh, there is uh, the performance results. Uh, here you can see that um, the simplest model uh, achieved uh, acceleration, but the other models were significant, significantly slower on FPGA than on CPU. Uh, we have uh, calculated uh, the FPGA time using uh, the simulation time and uh, the maximum frequency of uh, the designs. Uh, the next uh, tool is uh, the TVM tool, uh, which has been uh, developed, developed in the University of Washington, and it's now uh, supported by Apache Foundation. Uh, so as input to this uh, tool, we use uh, the ONNX representation of our models. It's uh, translated into uh, the computational graph, uh, LLVM operations, and uh, the weights. Uh, this uh, model is then tra trans uh, transferred onto the uh, system on a chip, 
where the runtime environment is running on CPU and uh, the VTA accelerator is uh, running on the FPGA. So the runtime uh, takes uh, the uh, representation of the model and uh, feeds it into the accelerator and gets the results. So here you can see the VTA accelerator structure. Uh, it consists of uh, the instruction fetch module, which fetches instructions from the memory. Uh, the load module, which loads uh, uh, the input data and uh, the weights and uh, transfers transfers uh, them to the compute module, which uh, performs uh, tensor operations and matrix multiplications. And uh, later, the store module uh, stores uh, the results into the memory. So here you can uh, see the resource usage of the VTA core. Well, it's the same for all models. It's a universal core, it's, so it's the same for all the models. And uh, this uh, slide presents uh, the performance uh, results. Uh, we have run uh, the original Keras model on uh, the standard uh, Keras runtime on CPU. Then we have run it. Uh, then we have optimized and run it uh, using uh, the TVM tool and uh, on CPU and on GPU. So uh, here we can see that uh, uh, the simplest MISTFC model has been accelerated on uh, the VTA core comparing to the original uh, Keras runtime. But in, in all other cases, uh, the VTA core was signif significantly slower than uh, the other platforms. So we tried to uh, optimize and quantize uh, the convolutional uh, model, but uh, uh, we haven't achieved uh, significant acceleration for it. So some conclusion. Uh, so we can see that uh, inference on FPGAs is possible using uh, the open source tools. Uh, and we can even accelerate uh, simple neural networks. But uh, these, um, these tools are useful only for some low power applications, which uh, do not need uh, good performance. Uh, if we need performance, we need uh, maybe bigger FPGAs uh, with bigger uh, specialized cores. But uh, the best results, what GPUs uh, are still the fastest platform. So thank you. Questions? Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, we are waiting for questions from our participants. So, um, you. Uh, yes, yes. Can I, add, yeah. mm -hmm. I am more software guy, so my question is probably stupid. So, once the architecture is generated, is it expensive to build the real device from the description very long? Uh, you mean uh, the chip? Yes. Uh, yes, it's usually very expensive. You need to um, synthesize the logical scheme uh, to produce um, uh, the uh, uh, the Order. model for for the factory. Send it to the factory, and the factory then uh, uh, produces 
you the chip well usually it's very expensive but in, in, in principle one can do it so it's, it is possible to make one chip not not a serious but just one um well in theory yes but you it will be very expensive well so it's usually it's not the case so it's not it's just really have something like 3d printer you push the button button and then chip goes outside <laughs> no. no not yet <laughs> okay thank you mm -hmm. thank you Mikhail, um Alexei um, Harashilov and you are colleagues. Yeah. You are colleagues. <laughs> uh, you, you are working in one team? Yeah. Uh, no, we work in different teams, but we work in the same department of mm -hmm. our institute. Uh -huh, thank you. Um, do you know maybe uh, our Tom's Polytechnic University has some uh, collaboration some kind of collaboration with your institute yes yes yeah. in uh, what field do you know oh <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't know yeah we uh, have uh, connections with the tomsk polytechnical mm -hmm. oh no no oh. not polytechnical yeah. tomsk oh, so, um, haven't you been ever in Tomsk? Um, not, not, no. So, no. welcome. <laughs> welcome in Tomsk, okay. to Tomsk. Maybe next time. <laughs> okay, okay. Next time in real, yes. Um, I hope sometimes uh, we have no such situation with coronavirus and... Um, we will host you uh, we will host uh, a conference not online but in real time yeah, yeah so okay. thank you uh maybe we will have some question if um if i i will see if i see uh questions in our chat i will send you okay yeah okay uh, mm -hmm. and i will post uh, the, your response uh, in our chat mm -hmm. Oh, you can do it. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. See you. And the next speaker is uh, Konstantin Maslov. Konstantin, a PhD student at Tomsk Polytechnic University. I'm glad to see you, Konstantin. Uh, nice to meet you, uh, dear all. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Konstantin Sorry. Maslov. I'm a PhD researcher at the Division uh, for Information Technology at Tomsk Polytechnic University. And my today's uh, presentation is on uh, Bayesian optimization uh, with time decay and jitter for hyperparameter tuning of neural network. Uh, while hyperparameters are often considered a nuance by data scientists, they should not, uh, because the performance of deep learning algorithms can significantly depend on the values of the hyperparameters used to define the topology of neural networks to tune the optimization algorithms, to augment the data sets, and so on. Therefore, in order to achieve the best possible performance of neural networks, uh, it's necessary to carry out hyperparameter tuning. Uh, this problem can be addressed by several methods like brute force, random search, and meta heuristics such as genetic algorithms and swarm intelligence uh, algorithms. But in the number of recent studies, Bayesian optimization methods have gained particular popularity for the hyperparameter tuning, since, unlike the previously mentioned, uh, they can significantly reduce the number of calls to the objective function, which becomes especially important as we are facing constantly increasing data sets, very deep neural networks, and consequently large training times for one model. It's also important that an optimization algorithm makes it possible to balance between exploration and exploitation. Exploration is sampling from unconsidered areas of uh, search domain, and exploitation is uh, using knowledge about uh, the possibility to find a more optimal value uh, in the local area, value of the objective. However, in Bayesian optimization algorithms, typically it's possible to distinguish an explicit random phase exploration phase 
and a phase of further search uh, for optimal values, somehow combining exploration and exploitation. And it forces the researcher to define an additional parameter for the optimization algorithm, the number of iterations for the random, uh, for the random search, and may also lead to, the optim to very suboptimal results. Uh, if, for example, in further search phase, the optimization algorithm paid too much attention to either exploration or exploitation. Uh, well, the aim of this study is to modify the ordinary base, uh, Bayesian optimization algorithm by introducing time decaying parameter jitta, uh, denoted as C, uh, for dynamic balancing between exploration and exploitation. Uh, the objectives were to design the modified algorithm, implement the ordinary and the modified algorithm, first evaluate them on a number of uh, test functions, artificial landscapes, and then apply them to a practical problem. In this case, it was a problem of semantic image segmentation. Uh, here we can see the pseudocode for the ordinary Bayesian optimization algorithm. It has two loops. The first one is a uh, Wait a second. The first one is a typical random search. The second one is the Bayesian optimization itself. In the first loop, we just uh, randomly sent our hyperparameters, now our object. Uh, in the second uh, optimization, uh, in the second loop, we have uh, Bayesian optimization itself. And the idea behind uh, Bayesian optimization is to replace the objective with some like a surrogate model, uh, usually a Gaussian process, and solve optimization problem for this surrogate model. Optimization for the surrogate model is reduced to the optimization of uh, acquisition functions. And one of the most popular choice is uh, expected improvement. Expected improvement is usually parameterized uh, with uh, jitter parameter, and this parameter governs the degree of exploration exploitation. Uh, the greater the XC, the more explorative the algorithm is. And each optimization of the acquisition function allows obtaining a new vector of parameters, which is potentially better. And all parameter vectors and the corresponding values of the objectives are saved and utilized further to build new surrogate models at each iteration. Uh, this slide demonstrates uh, the modified version of the algorithm. Here, instead of two loops, we have only one. Uh, and the GT parameter is uh, changing like uh, this. It's decreasing with every iteration. So we can say with time it increases exploitation and decreases exploration. Uh, note that uh, modified version has less number of input parameters because there is no number of iterations at the random search phase, just because there is no random search phase anymore. Uh, and it should also be noted that all the Tilda codes are for the maximization problem. To find the global minimum, it's necessary to multiply the objective by minus one. Uh, to evaluate and compare the implemented uh, algorithms, eight artificial uh, landscapes were used. Uh, for them, the minimization problems uh, was being solved. Uh, the description of the landscapes is given in the, the slide. Uh, there we have the name of the landscape, its definition, uh, global minimum, D here denotes the number of dimensions, at search domain. Uh, and uh, uh, here is the rest of the test functions. Uh, <clears throat> in this slide, you can see uh, surface plots of these artificial landscapes for the case d equals 2. And we can uh, uh, assess the diversity and identify profession ch uh, potential challenges for the optimization of uh, like vast flat areas, many local minimum and maxima, or uh, non-convex features. Uh, for example, here we have sphere function, it's just a simple convex function, uh, Zahara function, a convex function with a very large uh, valley area, a uh, Rosenblock function, a non convex function with uh, also a very large area like area, uh, valley like area, uh, Stiblinski trunk function, non convex with several basins, uh, Schwefel and Rastrigin, both are non convex multimodal functions. Grebank non convex uh, multimodal functions, a function and at large scale it resembles a bowl shaped function. 
and actually functions a multimodal function with with large gradients near the global minimum. Uh, this slide show uh, wait a second uh, for each artificial landscapes uh, I considered cases d equals 5, 10 and 50. Uh, so represent a situation of small, medium, a large number of the parameters. For each artificial landscape and each value of d, different configurations of algorithm 1 and algorithm 2 was employed. For algorithm 1, uh, I chose n equals m equals 50, and cases of c equal to 0 0.001, 0 0.01, and 0 0.1. And for algorithm 2, n was equal to uh, 100, and c prime was equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 1. Uh, 30 runs uh, of the algorithms were performed for each case. And in that way, for each configuration, algorithms produced a series of near-optimal values for every artificial landscape. Uh, for each function and each value of d, the best, uh, best by average value results for algorithm, algorithm 2 was selected, and pairwise circles and text were carried out for the corresponding series of the found near optimal values in order to determine if there is a, statistic, a statistically significant difference in the results. Uh, and the results of these pairwise circles and tests are demonstrated in this table. Uh, thus, it can be shown that for your part of the functions, like uh, uh, sphere d equals uh, 50 and Rosenbrock d, uh, d equals 5. Uh, the algorithm, the second algorithm performs better than algorithm 1. For another part, like sphere d equals uh, 5, Zaharov d equals 10, and Stiblinsky Tran uh, d equals 10, the uh, first algorithm is better. But for the most of the artificial landscapes, no statistically significant difference was found. And it is true for the rest of the uh, rest for the uh, artificial landscapes. Uh, these results uh, do not allow uh, to make any unambiguous conclusion about the preference of one or another algorithm when tuning the hyperparameters of deep learning algorithms. And therefore, it's necessary to conduct further studies on practical problems. Such a problem was the problem uh, of uh, semantic uh, image segmentation of ABS Iberica treats uh, damaged by polygraphous proxies, uh, forest pests, in unmanned aerial vehicles imagery. Uh, the imagery consisted of uh, five classes, four classes of the tree life conditions and uh, background. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, there were serious limitations of the training set, so the importance of choosing a good set of hyperparameters increases. Uh, to deal with the problem, a fully convolution network based on the original UNet was utilized. It includes an encoder and a decoder. Usually, the encoder reduces the special dimensions of the input and decreases the number of feature maps. The decoder, on the other hand, restores the original image dimensions and reduces the number of feature maps, outputting uh, the probabilities of each class for every pixel in a patch. The UNET architecture differs from typical fully convolutional networks uh, in the presence of skip connections, which uh, directly copy feature maps from the encoder to the decoder in order to restore fine-grained details in the resulting segmentation map. Uh, to train the network, uh, soldier character efficiency was maximized, and its definition is represented here in the slide. Uh, in total, 10 hyperparameters were identified. They are related to the optimization algorithm used for searching the best weight coefficients, uh, like uh, logarithm of the learning scale, uh, like uh, uh, exponential learning rate decay. Uh, and uh, 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 parameters regarding the topology and regularization, like special dropout rate, uh, parameters regarding the loss function, smoothing coefficient and label smoothing coefficient, and parameters regarding the online augmentation techniques. Uh, 
The both algorithms were applied to the search of the optimal values of the unit hyperparameters, and here you can see the corresponding Fibonacci cubes. As can be seen, uh, both algorithm one and algorithm two are suitable for the addressed hyperparameter tuning problem, and uh, also algorithm two uh, C prime equals uh, 0 0.5 and produced uh, the best result. Uh, it's worth noting that the amount of the carried out uh, computation experiments doesn't allow to make any conclusions about the statistical significance of the obtained results. Uh, here you can see the segmentation results obtained with the best model to evaluate the performance Jacquard coefficients and means the Jacquard coefficients we used, their definitions are here in the slide. And uh, it uh, sh should be noted that Jacquard coefficient greater than 0 0.5 corresponds to the good quality of segmentation. And we see that uh, the obtained model classifies uh, four to five target classes successfully. And the low uh, segmentation quality for giant trees can be explained by its underrepresentation in the training site. And the visual similarity of its living trees and uh, trees of other species uh, are like PCA trees. Uh, so as a conclusion, the study proposed a Bayesian optimization algorithm with stem decay for finding the optimal hyperparameters of renal network. This algorithm has less number of uh, parameters than the ordinary one. Uh, for a part of the Artificial landscapes, uh, the proposed algorithm works better for the part, uh, for a part worse, and for the most of the landscapes, there is no statistically significant difference. Uh, the proposed algorithm can show the comparable performance for alternative hyperparameters of a neural network, but no claims can be made about non randomness of this result since there is no enough experiments. And I want to cite one of the reviewers at the end. While not a silver button, the proposed algorithm seems to be a good addition to the toolbox of data scientists. Um, I want to add that uh, the fact that the proposed algorithm shows greater performance in some cases, or at least comparable one, uh, allows to assert the potential usefulness of the further research in this direction. For instance, it makes sense to consider various mechanisms for decreasing the cheetah parameter in time, differing from different from those that were presented in this uh, presentation. And also in int interesting directions are the use of adaptive uh, changes in the GT parameter or applying different acquisition functions. <clears throat> Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Konstantin. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Rostislav, uh -huh. Can I ask, meanwhile, while I look for other questions? So the first is uh, you mentioned the quality of your algorithm, but I missed. Did you say anything about uh, training time? Does it take more time for to train your network or network or not? Uh, <clears throat> training time doesn't depend on the hyperparameter tuning algorithm. So we have a set of hyperparameters mm -hmm. and uh, then we train our network. Uh, and the training time is defined by the amount of data we have, uh, by the deepness, uh, by the depth of the network, and by the our, by our training procedure. Uh, but uh, if you want to compare the first algorithm and the second one by their uh, computational costs, uh, their computational costs are completely equal because uh, in mm -hmm. both cases, we have uh, 100 calls to the objective function. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, uh, as uh, a number of calls, the number of calls are equal, the, therefore the computational yeah. costs are also equal. And another question, your approach uh, looks quite general. So the question is, uh, did you think about uh, applying it to some other 
topics, not just image segmentation, maybe something in natural language process or processing or other fields of machine learning. Uh, yes, of course, it's completely possible. It's possible to apply this uh, happy primary return algorithm not only for deep learning algorithms like neural networks, but also to other machine learning algorithms like support vector machines, and it completely depends on the application. Okay, but you don't have any results so, so far, right? No, we have not. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Anna, mm -hmm. Thank anything you. From the from the. Uh, no, but I have a quite general question. <laughs> so, uh, as far as I understand, uh, this is the topic of your um, PhD uh, thesis. Yes? It's possibly will be a part of it. A part. Mm -hmm. sure. So, uh, why did you choose this topic of uh, research? Uh, initially, I was working with... Uh, at the convolutional network networks applied to the UIV imagery. And uh, at some stage, uh, I and uh, my team, we have like uh, a project related to that, understood that uh, choosing a good set of hyperparameters is crucial if you want to uh, achieve uh, a great performance of algorithms, given that so we have a very limited data set. Uh, and uh, we tried first uh, the ordinary batch optimization algorithm, and then I was thinking, like, I think there is uh, a room for improvement, uh, but uh, although I can't uh, prove that it's improved at this stage, uh, I think I, I will continue the research mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if, um, dear participants, if you have some questions, please ask uh, in our Telegram chat and also uh, in our chat uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so we will uh, try to answer all your questions. And uh, of course, we can uh, make a discussion and uh, in, at our Telegram chat. So thank you. Thank you, Konstantin. And you. now um, let me introduce the next speaker, Evgeny Metzko, Hello, associate professor at Tomsk Technical University. So uh, let me begin. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the topic of our research, uh, research, uh, my research and my colleagues, co-authors, is uh, analysis of hardware implemented unit like convolutional neural networks. <clears throat> uh, convolutional neural networks uh, of various classes, various classes are successfully used to solve problems of recognizing different objects. For example, human faces, cars, objects on the Earth's surface, etc. There is a need to use unmanned, unmanned aerial vehicles (UAVs) uh, with special equipment uh, installed for monitoring hazardous and hard-to-reach objects. Uh, designing mobile monitoring systems with intelligent computer visual systems uh, requires to keep a balance between the speed of the computer computing unit the CNN performance for object recognition and the mass and power consumption of this device to increase the UAV flight time. And uh, the main aim of the research is to uh, study the effectiveness of uh, hardware implemented UNET CNN models in programmable logic gate arrays, FPGA, of modern systems on a chip. Uh, to, to achieve the main aim, we should achieve uh, some objectives uh, design unit models implement the models in software feed uh, the models using uh, the prepared data set implement the models in hardware and evaluate performance computational cost and power consumption of the software and hardware implemented cnns uh, 
Unit, <coughs> Unit models proposed for solving the problem uh, are developed on the basis of the original fully convolutional network Unit. Uh, differences from the original Unit model are uh, the input image of the network is uh, represented by uh, 256 by 256 by free sensor, which corresponds to an uh, ordinary HGB image. Convolutions do not reduce the size of the feature maps and cropping is not used. Uh, batch normalization light after each activation function, leaky or uh, yellow relu. Uh, and the output uh, tensor is calculated using C convolutions with one by one kernels, thereby uh, allowing to classify the pixels of C class uh, classes. Another CNN model with the use of delayed convolutions was proposed on the basis of the CNN model. And the delayed convolutions differ from original convolutions by inserting uh, zero coefficients to the convolution kernel. Uh, delayed convolutions are governed by deletion rate that shows the distance between neighboring non-zero coefficients of the kernel. Uh, and uh, after the unit model with delayed convolutions is obtained by replacing every two consequent convolutions by uh, convolutions with three by three kernels, uh, <clears throat> every two consequent convolutions with three by three kernels um, was um, changed uh, by one delayed convolutions with five, five by five kernels. And uh, this is deletion rate is two. <clears throat> What about data set preparation? Uh, the, the data set consists of pictures of ABS Iberica trees damaged by Polygraphus proximus. There are four classes of trees, living, dying, recently dead, and long dead, and background for semantic uh, segmentation. And um, 2004 samples were trained, and uh, 673 samples for validation was used. Were, were used. Uh, and uh, each image pair patch uh, has size 256 by 256 and uh, uh, labeled by experts. Uh, labeling by experts is time consuming task, of course, and therefore it's necessary to automate this process using the CNN. There are two software implementations using different hardware, uh, CPU plus GPU system with uh, Python and Keras technologies and uh, uh, CPU only system with C, C++ implementations. What about hardware implementation? Uh, Mobile monitoring systems with uh, intelligent computer vision systems requires low power consumption and using FPGA is a solution. Uh, system on chip Zinc uh, 7000 by Xalix was used to, uh, for hardware implementations of CNN with uh, using system Verilog uh, hardware description language and Vivada card. <clears throat> On this slide, we can see uh, an enlarged functional diagram of the computing unit based on FPGA. Uh, computing units support direct memory access for FPGA-based CNN models. And the main feature of the unit is uh, universal unified uh, computational blocks for convolution and some sampling. The unification of convolution some sample sample blocks uh, is achieved by extracting uh, parameters of these uh, blocks, usually specified as a stage of their synthesis, and placing them in the configuration memory region, uh, which called config config space. Also, there is a narrow computer unit in CU uh, containing universal uh, unified computing blocks. Uh, in the block uh, hardware implementation of CNN on the uh, block diagram on the slide. <clears throat> and so uh, there is a computer unique architecture uh, on the slide, which uh, consists of DDR3 external memory with controller, 
dual core ARM Cortex uh, A9 CPU and FPGA, FPGA with uh, DMA controller, config space, and narrow computer unit. Uh, narrow computer unit includes 40 or uh, I'm sorry, uh, 64 universal unified computational blocks uh, simultaneously working on each layer of the CNN. And each output feature map is simultaneously generated by a separate universal computational blocks. What about uh, results? Uh, <clears throat> the first is a result of uh, first software implementation uh, with uh, core i7 CPU, i7 C uh, CPU, and uh, NVIDIA GeForce GTX. 1080 Ti GPU with uh, Python and Keras technologies. <clears throat> the trained model, uh, the trained model was software applied to the uh, semantic segmentations of the test area image of an Abyss Siberica forest. A visual analysis of the test area, the ground truth, and the outputs of the CNN models has shown the uh, that both models are capable to detect the boundaries between the trees and classifying uh, successfully a considerable part of the abyss tree, uh, Siberica crowns. Uh, table one lists IOO values. IOO is a metric intersection of a union. And uh, table one lists uh, values for the both, uh, both CNN models. Uh, unit and unit with deleted convolutions using a leaking uh, relu activation function. Function. It also shows uh, mean intersection over union values to evaluate the overall performance of the models while classifying the test area image. Uh, the boss in a model successfully classify all classes, but with a low segmentation quality for dying trees. It can be explained by the underrepresentation in the training set and visual similarity uh, with living trees and Pisces trees, which are part of the background. As can be seen uh, from table two, UNET with deleted convolutions gives an advantage in uh, inference time of a patch of about uh, three milliseconds on a CPU uh, plus GPU. Uh, while providing a comparable segmentation quality with table of one. Uh, the next software implementation on uh, using core i, uh, i3 uh, CPU and uh, also the training models were software applied on the CPU uh, and uh, with different types of floated point numbers, float 32 and float 16. Uh, we can see that uh, UNET uh, with deleted convolutions has a drop in performance uh, because in this software implementation, this type of uh, <clears throat> this, this type of convolution implies a complex process of working with memory. Also, uh, use <clears throat> also use of float sixteen numbers leads to a drop in performance due to the fact that this CPU does not support half precision floating point numbers. And converting numbers from float, uh, float uh, 32 to float 16 requires additional costs. Uh, but use of float 16 allows to decrease RAM size of the program. What about results of the CNN implementation in hardware? Uh, experiments with the UNET model were carried out using both 16-bit and 32-bit uh, floating point numbers and different uh, activation functions, ELU, ReLU, and Leaky ReLU. Uh, the results uh, for this model are shown in uh, Table 5. We see that the Leaky ReLU has the best results of segmentation quality, and this activation function is used for experiment with deleted convolutions. In general, the difference between the quality of segmentation is two, three hundredths. Uh, computing speed evaluation of hardware implemented CNN models was conducted by semantic segmentation of image patch, patch with uh, size 
256 by 256. Uh, the system on chip used it possible to operate the FPGA with a clock frequency of 100 megahertz and to organize the use of uh, 64 universal computer uh, computing blocks in the NCU. The inference time, uh, medians and median absolute deviations for the both uh, float 32 and float 16 are summarized in uh, table uh, 6. It follows that UNET model with deleted convolutions makes it possible to analyze an image patch on the FPGA more than 25% uh, faster than UNET model with float uh, 32 and uh, float 16. And table 7 shows the results of measuring the power consumption of the system on chip and the FPGA uh, resources in the form of the uh, various types number of cells for each unit models with float 32 and float 16. For these results, we can say that uh, use of float 16 allows to reduce the power consumption of the system on chip and uh, the, uh, also it allows to reduce required FPGA resources for storing the input data and weight coefficients uh, of the CNN model in comparison with float 32 values. What about uh, results in general? Uh, the use of dilated convolutions in the CNN model leads to a, uh, to a slightly loss of segmentation accuracy by uh, 200 for the MEIOU metric. Uh, the segmentation quality when using float 16 numbers in FPGA uh, computations does not differ from the results of segmentation quality when using float 32. Uh, the computation speed of software implemented CNN models on an uh, Intel Core i7 CPU with an NVIDIA GeForce uh, 1080 GPU is almost a thousand times harder, higher than uh, computation speed of the uh, these CNN models on FPGAs. Uh, the software implementation of the unit model on an Intel Core i3 CPU uh, with a frequency of uh, 3600 megahertz performs a patch segmentation about uh, 2.4 times faster than on a FPGA with a frequency of 100 megahertz. And the unit model with delayed convolutions allows to analyze uh, a mid image patch on the FPGA more than 25% uh, faster than original unit model. And the power consumption. Uh, uh, the power consumption of uh, hardware implementation with FPGA is slightly more than 5 watts, which is five ti uh, 50 times less than, the out, uh, than that of the graphics accelerator NVIDIA, uh, which has a consumption about uh, 250, uh, 250 watts and uh, 8 times less than that of, uh, that of the CPU. Uh, power consumption, which has uh, 43 watts. At the moment, at the moment, uh, moment uh, six, 64 universal uh, computing units in the NCU are not used quite not optimally, and it requires further studies and modifications of the computer unit to improve the performance of the hardware implementation uh, on the FPGA. Further research is required on the uh, use of parallel computing uh, in the CNN uh, layers. And the obtained results of complex studies of the hardware implemented unit models are of great scientific importance for uh, the developers of intelligent computer vision systems as part of mobile systems for monitoring objects of the Earth's surface based on UAVs. Uh, the use of uh, presented results will allow to make more informed uh, design decisions when creating intelligent uh, computer vision systems for solving various applied monitoring problems. And thank you for your attention. Uh, your questions, please. Uh -huh. Evgeny, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, 
have no questions for now. Okay, I have a question. Sorry. <laughs> so, just for 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 person outside your topic, what's the principal difference? Uh, I mean, between typical, I mean, classical uh, neural network machine learning and uh, for, for hardware, uh, like in your example, do you really need to know a lot about your hardware architecture, or, or is it something different kind of optimization? That it's um, FPGA has a different organization. Uh, if we compare it in uh, with uh, CPU, for example, mm -hmm. and um, for hardware implement uh, for hardware implementation of uh, computer CNN, we should uh, just prepare some uh, weight coefficients for hardware. Mm -hmm. And we we can use uh, training and learning process the same uh, the same if uh, if we uh, use if we implement uh, CNN in CPU learning process for CPU and uh, FPGA is the same but the different implementations and uh, of course we should uh, understand and know uh, a lot of information about our FPGA to implement, to hardware implement uh, convolution networks. And the implementation is different between CPU and FPGA. And just to give, give, give me some uh, understanding, uh, so assume I'm just a, a fresh person okay. <laughs> to, who understands uh, rather well the machine learning and all theoretical stuff, but knows nothing about hardware. How much time it would it take for me just to, to move to your era? Would I think a lot, I think a lot month, of time. One, week, one month, one year, one decade. I, I think one year or maybe two years. It's, so it's I, not think, I think uh, uh, hardware, hardware uh, development has a, uh, uh, should, you should have more experience mm -hmm. uh, before starting to hardware. And you should uh, understand uh, low level architecture, uh, no maybe low level languages and so on. Uh, I think it's, uh, it requires uh, more, a lot of uh, much time to, mm -hmm. to start with it. It's my, in my opinion. Okay, and, and then standard question, is there some standard like online course or textbook just to start? for a student who just like to, to switch to this topic? Um, recommend some courses? <laughs> yeah, like, okay, if there is some, you know, in some uh, areas there are some like, okay, would like to start uh, a study algorithm, there is starting book on algorithm, right? It's just, but okay. regarding the hardware architectures, is there something or you should just search for sort of different research papers and uh, it's distributed knowledge? Uh, uh, I think if you want to start uh, in hardware implementation, you should, uh, there is one good book for this, mm -hmm. I know, it's uh, author of Harris, mm -hmm. and uh, Computer uh, Digital Semotechnics and Computer Architecture. It's okay. a big, big book, so something about 1000 pages, mm -hmm. and I think uh, before starting you should read it. Okay. In my opinion. Thank you. And also, I know the Exponenta, Exponenta, Russian company, mm -hmm. has uh, some courses, online webinars, uh, dedicated to FPGA development. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Evgeny. And we have one question. Uh, did you compare your NCU architecture to the other neural network accelerator architectures? Uh, yes, I I have some compares, uh, comparison, but uh, I did not uh, find uh, implementation uh, the same implementation the implementation is the same uh, with uh, our task. It's a forest recognition, uh, trees recognition, but uh, some comparisons. Uh, 
uh, was was made. Was. Mm -hmm. But uh, its implementation is uh, its implementation. Uh, uh, how can I say? Uh, did not based on some uh, ready implement uh, some uh, um, implementation which uh, maybe ha uh, was ready for example it's uh, its implementation was uh, created from zero mm -hmm. from nothing okay mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. So this is all. Um, thank you again for your uh, very interesting good talk. Uh, and now we will have a break uh, till 1 p.m. Moscow time or 5 p.m. Tomsk time. So please check the agenda at our uh, conference website. See you soon. Thank you.
Welcome to the Exact Pro Systems YouTube channel. Here you can catch up on the latest technology updates in software testing and development for the financial industry. These include the applications of AI and machine learning, DLT, cloud computing, and many other technologies and solutions. You can find the recordings of our latest conferences featuring top-level speakers from global market infrastructures, world-leading banks, and technology vendors. You can watch the Exec Pro experts sharing their insights with the fintech community at events all around the world and with our subscribers in the regular Exec Pro Talks segment. If you're interested in the Exec Pro test tools released to open source, you'll find a list of tutorials here as well. We also put a new spin on some of the popular shows that we bet you've never thought were about software testing. This channel is for chief technology information and compliance professionals, product owners, and software quality assurance and development specialists of all levels. Subscribe to our channel, hit the bell button to stay up to date on all the videos, and visit our website execpro.com if you want to learn more about us.
are you seeing uh, my screen now? Hello, friends. Hello. Um, thank you for joining us again. And we continue our conference uh, with the keynote speaker, Mohamed El Sayed Abdelaziz, professor at Tomsk Polytechnic University. Uh, hello, Mohamed. Uh, hello. So, uh, let me start with your presentation. Uh, okay. Uh, are you seeing my screen here? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, it's okay. And first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Thomas University to ask me to join to this conference. Uh, my presentation was titled Meta Heuristic uh, Techniques uh, and Their Applications. Uh, I am Mohammed Abdelaziz, uh, belong to Thomas University and also Zagazig University. This is my contact if uh, everyone wanted to ask me for research or something like that. In my presentation, I will discuss uh, Meta Heuristic uh, and also application for global optimization and image segmentation. Uh, we're going to also to uh, study or uh, explain how we can use meta heuristic techniques uh, in medical application also on cloud computing and uh, engineering and the economic application and the last point in our presentation about the conclusion and the future work for meta heuristic and its application uh, in general we can define the meta heuristic techniques as a computational method which simulated the natural process uh, this this techniques can be categorized into uh, six uh, families. Uh, the first of one is called evolutionary algorithm, swarm intelligence, natural phenomena, uh, sport algorithms, and the physical physics and the mathematics. Uh, last one is called the human inspiration. Uh, each point or each technique from this uh, meta heuristic techniques have many uh, different techniques. For example, uh, in genetic algorithm. And the genetic uh, and the genetic programming differential evaluation all of them belong to uh, evaluation algorithm there is another one that called a swarm techniques this swarm techniques or swarm intelligence have many other algorithms such as gray wolf particle swarm artificial peak colony and other the main difference between this algorithms is how we can inspire from the nature or from the physics or from sport Actually, the main difference between this meta heuristic techniques and the traditional method like gradient descent or Newton Raphson or something like that is that this method that called the traditional method, method is easy to implement it. However, this traditional method can be stuck in local optimal. Also, they required many gradient information from the in function or the applications that we're going to using the techniques. However, the meta heuristic techniques can benefit from a stochastic component and don't need to the gradient information. Also, they have different ability or operators that can be applied to improve the ability of searching about the optimal solution. According to this behavior of meta heuristics, they have been applied to different applications. This application including for some engineering design problem or numer numerical or structure optimization function also for image segmentation and feature selection and other applications. The first application we can discuss here in our uh, presentation, uh, maybe we, we will start by global optimization and the other application. But before this one, we focus on one of them that called swarm techniques. This is swarm techniques aim to um, uh, in, uh, emulate the behavior of birds or uh, or animal or bee or something like that uh, in in nature we can say the animal can uh, live in a population or a swarm and they try to catch prey the first if if we consider in nature in nature we can consider this is the population and this is the prey and this green green rectangle represents the search of area that contains the, the swarm and prey so the main task here, how to find the prey. If this is swarm knows the location or, or the position of a prey, all of them will catch the prey. Otherwise, they will spread in the domain and search about that prey. 
This actual weekend, we wanted to simulate it in our optimization techniques. After some evaluation, this evolution may be the distance between the solutions or the, the agent in the swarm and the break. So according to the best one, the other solution or other, uh, other elements will follow it and update their position. The next step is to update the solution again and determine the best one. Best one here in our algorithms or our optimization techniques mean the best solution. After that, we updated the solution again until found the best solution. And this one is considered the best one and the best prey. For that, we, using, we wanted to use the meta heuristic techniques in our applications. The first application here is the global optimization. The global optimization is a set of functions that have many different uh, points that can consider as local or uh, global optimization. And we, we want to determine the best of them. According to the behavior of a global optimization, they, they have been applied in different uh, real applications, such as classification, scheduling, and the parameter estimation, and the medical image classification, and the other. Here, we want to see how we can provide a new meta heuristic technique and apply it for a global optimization. According to our study, we wanted to improve the behavior of one meta heuristic algorithm called sine cosine algorithm. This sine cosine algorithm is dependent on the two triangu triangular functions that are called sine and cosine, and we think both of them to update the solutions in the current population. And this is the step of how we can update the solution according to the behavior of sine cosine algorithm. However, this sine cosine algorithm has some problem, and this problem maybe affected the, the performance of the um, sine cosine during the searching about the optimal solution. This limitation is depend on the initial population. This initial population may be affect on the convergence of the algorithm. To generate the optimal solution from this point, we can consider we have a set of solutions. This a set of solution may be considered as a green circle. This is the initial one. After some iteration, this we found the best solution. According to that best solution, all other solution will, will follow the, the red one. However, this red one may be is an optimal one. Maybe the optimal one, optimal one in the opposite direction. This opposite, opposite direction, we needed to follow it. So this is the considered opposite based solution. To solve this problem or this limitation, we can use opt opposite based learning techniques. That depends on the equation number six. It depends on the lower and the upper and the current solution. The, 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 main, the main important point for this one is to find the opposite direction for the current one and then determine if the current one is better or it is best or it is the opposite direction is the best this one can benefit for selecting the initial population to make this our to make this more clear we can consider if we have five uh, solutions and we determine we want to determine if this one is the best or it is opposite one is the best so we computed the opposite direction for each of our solution, the next step is to determine the best of the 10 solutions. I mean here, we have five solutions in the first. After that, we computing the opposite uh, best solution for each of them. So we have 10 solutions now. So we want to determine the best of them. This best one, we can use to update the solution in the next iteration. And this can lead us to convergence faster to the optimal solutions. According to this behavior, we developed algorithms that call the opposite sine cosine algorithm. And this opposite sine cosine algorithm has been applied to different global optimization functions. Here, some of them, this is example of these functions. And here, this is the dimension of each of them and the lower and the upper boundary for each of them. This is the results obtained by using the opposite sine cosine algorithm. From this results, we can see the Opposite based learning has largest effect on the performance of sine cosine when compared to the, the proposed one with the traditional one. In addition, we compared the proposed 
sine cosine algorithm with other techniques such as opposite BSO and we found that the sine cosine algorithm has largest effect and provide better results than BSO. The next point, we also try to apply new techniques that called the Grewolf optimization by combining it with different techniques such as chaotic opposite based and differential evaluation. Here in general, the Grewolf optimization techniques is aimed to emulate or simulate the behavior of a gray and how can catch the prey in the nature. This is the steps of the traditional Grewolf algorithm and how can catch the prey or how can find the optimal solution. In, the, in general, this one can be divided into exploration and exploitation. This is the two main phases in meta heuristic techniques. If anyone wanted to uh, update the, the updated the meta heuristic techniques, can update it either either the uh, exploration or exploration phase. Here we try to using different techniques to improve the gray wolf optimization techniques. First of them, we using chaotic logistic map. The second one is using OBL. After that, differential evaluation and disruption operator. All of these techniques can be combined together with the Gray Wolf optimization to improve its behavior. However, each of these four techniques have, has its own task. For example, the chaotic maps are used to generate the initial population. As we say before, the initial population has largest effect on the convergence of the algorithm. So we using here the logistic map to generate the initial population. However, there is many different chaotic maps can be used. But according to our experimental and other experiment from literature, we found that the logistic maps is better than other one. In addition, we using the disruption operator. This disruption operator has been used to improve the explority, exploration ability of several meta heuristics. Since it depends on the distance between the current one and the current neighborhood solutions, and also maybe depend on the best one and the current one. This this used to improve the diversity of the solution during the searching process. The next the next algorithm we're using to improve the gray wolf is called the differential evaluation. As we know, the differential evaluation depends on three operators that called the mutation, a crossover, and selection. All of them has has different improvement or has different effect on the performance of the algorithm. According to this al techniques, we combined them in one algorithm and applied to improve the performance of a gray wolf algorithm. And first of our algorithm, we generate the initial population according to the chaotic maps. After that, we apply OBL to determine the best initial population. After that, we're going to update the solution. However, here we can use either the operator of gray wolf optimization or the operator of differential evaluation. After we updating the solution according to this one, we can apply the disruptor operator. To evaluate the performance of this algorithm, we're using different global optimization techniques, some of them from the computational for 2014, and this is the behavior or this is the definition of each function. And this is the, the results obtained by our algorithm. From these results, we can see the high performance of the operators that combine it with the gray wolf as we compare it with the traditional gray wolf algorithm. However, we're going to apply this, this new techniques to real application. This real application including Galaxy image classification. This galaxy image classification is collected from different space or galaxies, as we can see here from catalog called EFIGI. This catalog contains four types. These four types, we can see the most similarity between these techniques or these images, and we needed to make classification for each of them. To make this one, we converted our algorithm from working only for real. Uh, or continuous uh, function like a global optimization, we using our algorithm as a feature selection method. This is the main modification here, or the main point here is to convert from real to discrete algorithm. Actually, to make this one, 
we we using or we convert the current solution in in the population according to this function to become boolean boolean vector that contain only zero and one. According to th this value, we can determine which feature is is the most important and which feature we can ignore or remove from our extracted features. To, to evaluate the performance of the selected features, we using this current fitness function. According to, to this function, we determine the accuracy of our algorithm and to compare between the, the current solution and the other solution in the same population. From this one, we found that the proposed algorithm can get the smallest number of selected features with the smallest in the, in the smallest number. Uh, sorry. Uh, in smallest uh, CPU and also high has high accuracy over other algorithms. This is the first application. We want to see how can we use the meta heuristic techniques. Another application we can apply the meta heuristic technique for for it is called the image segmentation. In image segmentation. We mean we we want to, to spread the image into it is component or into into uh, it is the smallest classes there is there are many image segmentation techniques have been proposed such as a clustering and the thresholding however the thresholding image segmentation method have more attention than other approach due to their, their simplicity and high accuracy against the other methods so in general we can divide the image threshold method into groups the first one is called by lethal second one is called multi-level threshold for the bi-level threshold we only wanted to determine only one value that called the threshold value that spreads the current image in two classes however in our real application the image can cannot have only one two objects we so we want the multi-level threshold to apply and using them and using it to apply for this image segmentation problem. The problem definition of the multi-level thresholding is illustrated by considering a gray level image I to be segmented and consisted of K, K plus one classes. The, K, the case thresholds are required to divide the image into subgroups. This can be seen from these equations in which each classes has it has it is own pixels that determine or that satisfies this condition and C1 also contains the, three the pixels that, that satisfies this condition and CK is the class number K that satisfies this condition. So to determine this threshold value that called T1, T2 until TK, we needed to convert this one to, into optimization problem. This in, in optimization problem can be considered as this equation that that consider as a maximization function. Here, there is two, the two most popular function used are the OTSO and the KBOR function. The OTSO function defined by this equation and the KBOR function divided by this equation. In general, there are many algorithms or many function can be used as ob uh, objective function and applied for image segmentation. Actually, in our, uh, in our work or our presentation, we only focus only on OTSO and KBOR functions. In this application, we apply two algorithms that called well optimization algorithm and the most flam optimization for multi-level thresholding image. In general, each of these algorithms has its own behavior and simulated different uh, different phenomena from nature. For example, the most flam inspired from natural behavior of mosses, which have a special navigation style as the night since they fly using the moon light. The whale algorithms emulated the natural cooperative behavior of whales during the searching about prey. Here, this is the style or the flow chart of our algorithms and how it can be used to find the optimal threshold value. First of all, we, def we generated the population according to these equations. After that, we computed the fitness function and updated the solution using the operators or the equations of each algorithm. After that, we repeat this until find the optimal solution and satisfy the condition or end the condition. 
to evaluate the performance of our algorithm, we evaluate it by using different image from nature and compare it with different algorithms. Also, we using some definition of uh, we using different performance measures such as BSNR and SSIM. Both of them is the most popular measures are used in image segmentation application. This is some results from our paper. And first, the BSNR and SSIM, we found that the both algorithms that called whale and the most flame can provide little, little better uh, performance better than other algorithms. Also, we're using, we using an uh, ANOVA test to compare if there is significant difference between the results or not. According in most results, we found there is significant difference between our algorithms and other techniques. The next point now, how we can use the meta, meta heuristic techniques in medical applications. Here we will study only one application that is called COVID. COVID-19, as we know, it is spread in last of uh, 2020. And most of them, to determine if the cases or the patient have COVID or not, and it is most expensive. So we're using image, image classification or image processing to determine if the cases has COVID or not. In our techniques here, we, we combine it deep learning and meta heuristic techniques. And first of all, we're using two data sets only. One of them is from Italy and another one from China. This is the related work for the COVID that published according to some techniques. In our algorithm or our technique, we extracted the features from the image by using CNN networks that is pre-trained based on the ImageNet dataset. This, this technique is called inception. The main aim of using this inception network is only to extract the feature from the image. After that, we're using a modified version from a new meta heuristics called Marine Predator Algorithm. This Marine Predator Algorithm, we, we modified it by using fractional calculus or a fractional order, which aim to support the meta heuristic by memory to improve their performance during the searching process. This is our algorithm or flowchart of our algorithm. And first, we extracted the feature by inception techniques. After that, we divided the data into, into training and testing. After that, we're using the training set to, to determine the relevant features by using the operator of modified version of from uh, MBA or marine predator algorithm by using a fractional calculus. Fractional calculus or a fractional order used here as a memory for the algorithm that saves the previous position or previous values. After obtain the best solution that considered has as the best relevant features, we reduce the size of testing set according to it and evaluate the performance of our algorithm. This is the result of our algorithm by using two data sets. From this one, we're using the smallest fitness function for our algorithm, FOMBA. And also, here we found that the, the smallest number of features are obtained by our algorithm. However, the CPU time is considered higher than another al algorithm that's called SMA. And this is the convergence behavior during the optimization, uh, the optimization process. And also, this is another measure that, such as F-score and the time and determine the best value according to the accuracy. The next application here is called task scheduling in cloud computing. This is, can be considered one of, of most important technique in cloud computing and also on folk computing and also related to Internet of Things, by the way. In general, the cloud, uh, the cloud task scheduling problem can be defined as how to schedule and allocate various tasks in, uh, to different virtual machine. Actually, we can, we can consider the cloud system consists of N, uh, NPM physical machines that consist of N virtual machines. The main objective here is to reduce the, the mix band by locating the best set of tasks to be executed on virtual machine. This can be represented by these equations, 15. And also we needed to 
determine or computing the required execution time. So according to this one, we converted the task scheduling problem to optimization problem. This, this is some techniques have been proposed before and the behavior of each of them. In this application, we using different meta heuristic techniques that called most most search uh, algorithm. This most search algorithm depend only on two equations. One of them represented the exploration, and another one represented the exploitation. As I told before, this is the main two phases in meta heuristic techniques. However, we using differential evaluation to update the performance of MSA or most search algorithm. And this is the behavior, uh, sorry, this is the flow chart of our algorithm. We're using the differential evaluation here to improve the exploitation behavior of MSA or most search algorithm. Actually, this, this problem can be considered the most important problem in the cloud computing. And also this problem is considered as a discrete problem since here we have integer solutions or integer value during the optimization. To evaluate the performance of our algorithm, we're using a cloud sim as an environment or a simulator, and also we compare the performance of our algorithm with BSO as well and SMA, traditional SMA, and also we're using some heuristic techniques such as S, uh, F, uh, uh, sorry, uh, SGF and RR. From this, from these results, we can find that the proposed algorithm that called MSA, MSDE. Have, has better results than other algorithms, especially it has the smallest make span value. Also, using real data set, this real data set, it is this data real data set from uh, collected from HBC2 and NASA IBS SC. Uh, from these results, we can we divided both of them, both of these results in small and large tasks. We found that the proposed algorithm, when the number of tasks increase, has the smallest make span. And also when become larger tasks, our algorithm still provide better results than other algorithms. This is for the second, data, uh, second real data set. I think it's the same behave, behavior of our algorithm. The next application for our meta heuristic techniques is called the parameter estimation of BV or photovoltaic cells. This one is can be using for solar energy or in general the using of solar energy has been increased since it has a clean source of energy. In this way the design of, uh, of photovoltaic cells has attracted the attention of research over the world. Considering the design problem involves the solution of complex nonlinear and the multimodal objective function Different algorithms have been proposed to, under, to identify the parameter of BV cells and balance. Most of them commonly fail in finding the optimal solution. So we propose in this one a modification algorithm for whale algorithm that called the chaotic whale optimization algorithm that depend on using the chaotic maps and apply them to find the optimal parameter. Actually, in general, the, there are, there, there are two uh, models. The first one is called single diet model, and second one is called double diet model. This is the most models, the most popular models in BV. However, there is another one that's called uh, a triple uh, diet model. The most different between between all of them is that single diet model has only five parameters needed to be determined during the optimization uh, process. However, uh, double diet model consists of seven parameters that needed be to determine during the searching process or the design process of BV. This is the algorithm that's called the chaotic whale optimization algorithm. And here is the, this one is the represent the objective functions that needed to be determined. And this is called root mean square error. The results for this techniques for single diet model or double diet model can be seen from this table. And we can see that the, our algorithm provides nearly the better results than other algorithms. However, most of these results can be, uh, we can see that most of them is similar or most of, the, of this algorithm is similar to each other. However, the performance of our algorithm according to the statistical analysis is better than this algorithms. 
We now going to see how we can using the meta the meta heuristic techniques in economic applications. This economic application we started by determine the price or forecasting the price of copper. An accurate forecasting uh, model for the price of uh, minerals plays a fatal role in future investments and the decision of mining project and the related companies. We proposed a hybrid model to provide an accurate model for forecasting the copper, copper price. The proposed model combined of using adaptive neurophasy inference system and the genetic algorithm. The main aim of using the genetic algorithm are used for estimating the ANFIS model parameters. In general, the, ANF the ANFIS model can be considered as an extension of a traditional neural network, but combined with the neurophasy system. In this system, we found that there is five layers and each of them has its has own task. The final here of ANFIS, we needed to determine the optimal parameter to obtain the best performance or the best prediction. To find this parameter, we combine it with genetic, combine the ANFIS with genetic algorithm to determine the parameter of ANFIS. After we combine this, this ANFIS and the genetic algorithm, we applied for the histor historical data from copper price from, from Stamper. 1987 to August 27. We divided the data set here into training and the validation. After that, we we using some measures such as root mean square error, MSA and MAE to evaluate the, beha the behavior or the performance of our algorithm. We found that the GA with ANFIS still provide better results than other techniques, especially the ANFIS or traditional ANFIS. This is the, the historical data and the predicted data by using different techniques. And this one also, the actually forecasting one. The second application for economic is called oil consumption forecasting. The oil consumption is one of the main factors that affect industry and the economy. Therefore, it is very important to, to estimate and to forecast the, con the consumption of oil. This helps the government to take the right decision and avoid uh, the wrong decision that lead to negative outcomes. For that reason, there are several methods have been, that have been applied for, to, uh, to forecast the oil cons consumption, such as adaptive neurophasy model. It, uh, it is one of the most popular data mining methods used to, to perform this forecast. However, the traditional one, as, as we see before, can be, uh, can be give not good results and this, and this may be uh, result from the stack in local optimal or the parameter of the ANFIS is not good. So we needed another technique that can be provided or determine the optimal parameter for ANFIS. We're using here a simple technique that's called sine cosine and we illustrated in the first of our presentation. Here we're using sine cosine only to determine the, the parameter of ANFIS and using the root mean square error as the objective function. And we apply the proposed model for three different countries. The first one is Canada and Germany, and third one is called Japan. And we also divided our data set into different, uh, into train and testing data set. And we validated the, the proposed algorithm by using different uh, measures, such as root mean square error, uh, MAE, MABE. And from these results, we found that the the combination between ANFIS and, S and SCA can, have, can provide better results than other techniques that can be combined with ANFIS, especially the genetic algorithm that we, we used before for other applications. And this is the real data when we compared it for the part of forecasting for each country. Finally, the conclusion and the future, and the future work in general here, there are three main major points of this review. The first measure is to illustrate how can we use the meta heuristic for image segmentation. Second one, how can we use the meta heuristic for global optimization and how we can improve the behavior of meta heuristic. The third point or the third measure is to improve the behavior of other algorithms and apply for task scheduling. And also how we can use the meta heuristic for economic applications. In the future work, we can 
uh, work together uh, if, if anyone wanted to join to me or my group to work with color image segmentation also. Uh, maybe we can say our group is the first group to use uh, fractional calculus uh, in improving the meta heuristic techniques and apply to different applications. Also, there, there are many different works we can work together if anyone uh, prefers to join to me. Thanks to you. Hello? Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. It was very interesting. Um, we have some questions. Yeah. What, uh -huh. what the main known problems or limitations of meta heuristic methods in solving practical problems? Okay. okay. Uh, uh, in, in general, the main limitation uh, of meta heuristic can be divided uh, into two points. The first one, uh, we can we can say in the exploration or exploitation, we can say the balance between exploration and exploitation. We needed a good uh, way or a good mechanism that has ability to uh, switch in between exploration and uh, exploitation. This is the first point. The second point is the parameter of each meta heuristic the parameter of each of this meta heuristic techniques must be determined perfectly because this parameter may be affect the performance especially when we apply it, this meta heuristic for practical problems this is mm -hmm. the two points it's okay yeah thank you welcome uh, another question mm -hmm. participant uh, Ludmila said that she is interested in optimization algorithm. Uh, so do you use classical algorithm, algorithms of uh, optimization like contracting? Actually, I, I can use a classical algorithm, but this one, this is the first time for me to see. I using the classical here, I mean, uh, Nilder Mead or gradient descent, Newton method, something like that. But this algorithm, I, I, I didn't see uh, before. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, actually, there is a trend for combining the meta heuristic with a with a classical one. I mean, we can using, for example, BSO with Nilder mean Nilder mean. This is technique can using as a local search to improve the behavior the behavior of meta heuristic techniques. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Other questions. So um, I have a question from um, our uh, conference chair and director of our school. If a software engineering student is interested in this topic, how long will it take for him to figure it out and to put it into the practice? According to me or according to their behavior? I mean, mm, according according to you, because you have already <laughs> done this way. <laughs> according to me, I think maybe two months or three months, and yes. can publish. Yeah, and can publish the paper, maybe in a Q1 journal also. But I, I thought it's about five years. <laughs> no, 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 no. Years. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I told you according to me or according to the student. For me, I know how we can improve the meta heuristic and how it can be applied to different applications. Mm -hmm. uh, according to student, I only needed from the student to have course for, for optimization and also for mm, the language that can be used, for example, MATLAB or Python. I think uh, most of, of your students using Python. Mm -hmm. um. A minute? Yeah, it's okay. I will check if we have other questions. Mm -hmm.
So, uh, how we can start to explore this topic? So, from, from what uh, we should start? Sir, I don't... You mean according to my plan or your plan? Uh, I don't know... I mean, uh, if a student uh, is interested in this topic, uh, so what uh, is the basic knowledge uh, should he has or from what uh, he he should start uh, learning uh, learning this uh, or um, just uh, to put into this uh, topic yeah okay i i think only needed as uh, in egypt we call this is called uh, research uh, operation research course operation research course that have only uh, knowledge about uh, gradient and neutral roughs on something method like this one after that we're going to direct to meta heuristic techniques maybe this is our plan so maybe from if we wanted to start from the next uh, the, uh, the next month we can start directly by applying uh, one or two lecture about uh, traditional method after that we can going to see how we can using the meta heuristic techniques then the last step may be how to apply these techniques to other applications according to the uh, behavior or the, uh, maybe say, the Thomas uh, research point. Mm -hmm. This is my plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Welcome. I think uh, many students uh, will be interested in this topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. It's a uh, yeah, perspective topic. Uh, so thank you, Mohamed. And uh, I hope we can see you in Tomsk. Yeah, and, that is my hope also. <laughs> <laughs> OK, bye. And um, we have next speaker, but um, in, uh, uh, the next speaker will join us in several minutes. So now we can uh, make a little, little break to watch uh, some video. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much and see you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 So let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Yusra Hafidi from Eindhoven University of Technology. Yusra, are you here? Hello. Hi. Are you ready to start? Hi. Yeah. yeah. OK, so I will share my presentation. OK. One moment. Okay.
All right. Do you see my presentation? Okay, I suppose that you see my uh, presentation. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Good. So, um, my name is uh, Yusra Hafidi. Uh, I'm a postdoc researcher at the Eindhoven University of Technology. And today I will be presenting uh, my research work entitled Fair Mutual Exclusion for N Processes. Uh, this work has been done by me, Irun Keren, and Jan Friso Kraute. So uh, let me first start my presentation with this slide in which I introduce mutual exclusion problem. So we are in a system where uh, there are uh, two processes, process zero and process one, and they both uh, are using a shared resource, which is called uh, a critical section. Uh, so in which just one process uh, should use it uh, at a time. So many algorithms uh, appear in order to deal with that problem. Uh, and uh, first, the classical algorithm, uh, the famous one proposed by Peterson, uh, original algorithm has been proposed for two processes. And then uh, other version appear to generalize this algorithm to consider more than two processes. For example, we have the version that uses filter lock uh, structure, and also the version that uses a tournament tree uh, structure. So in this talk, we will um, focus on the uh, tournament tree version. OK, so first I, I will uh, explain the concept of uh, Peterson's algorithm for two processes, so the classical one. Uh, in order to synchronize the access to the critical section, Peterson's algorithm uses uh, two shared variables. Uh, we have flag variable, and this variable indicates if a process requests access to the critical section. And the other variable indicates that a process is waiting for the other one. So suppose that we have process zero that wants to access to its critical section. It first sets its flag. So flag of process zero is set to true to say to the other process that I, I want to access to the critical section. And um, also it sets a weight variable uh, to zero to indicate that although I am uh, I want to access to get access to the critical section, but I'm waiting for process one. And then it enters to a waiting loop in which, as you see here, there is a while loop and there are two conditions. So uh, either the flag of the other process is true, uh, should be true, and also the weight uh, variable should be assigned to uh, the current process. So it, as you see here, uh, it can only get, uh, get out of this waiting loop if either uh, the flag of the other process is false or um, the weight variable is assigned to uh, the other process. So once it gets out from this waiting loop, it can get access to the critical section. And when it gets out, it resets its flag to false again in order to say that I'm finished with the, the critical section. So the same code is for process one as well. Now we have the algorithm. In order to say that the algorithm is correct, we should uh, verify some requirements. And the most important requirements are, uh, of course, mutual exclusion. Uh, the main requirement says that uh, only one process should uh, be in the critical section. And also we have uh, starvation freedom, which is a liveness property. Uh, it says that once a process requests access to its critical section, it will get access in a finite number of steps. So it will not wait forever. And we have another important property, which is bounded overtaking. It means that uh, there is a bound uh, that we can compute uh, on the number of, uh, of uh, rounds that a process uh, will wait in order to get its turn uh, to access to the critical section. So these uh, three requirements uh, are verified in the literature. Uh, 
And I would like to take your attention to the B, which is the, the bound for the version of two processes is two. It means that a process that requests access to the critical section, it waits for a maximum of two rounds before it gets uh, its turn. Now I, I will explain the generalized version um, for more than two processes. And of course, we focus on tournament tree version. In order to explain that, I will uh, first uh, explain what is this tournament tree structure. A tournament tree structure is a binary tree uh, of at least one level. So here we have a tree of two levels. So it depends on the number of processes. And the processes are actually candidates and they are uh, attached to the leaves. And each two processes uh, are competing together uh, in a node. Uh, so we have a process uh, at the left, uh, and we, we say that the, each side is zero, and the process at the right, uh, so the side is one. Um, and the winner uh, in each node uh, moves further uh, to the parent node, and the winner in the root node is the winner of the, the tournament tree, and it is privileged access to the critical section. So, um, as you see here, we need to we need functions in order to compute the initial position of processes in the tournament tree, and also a function or a formula in order to uh, to compute the the parent node. So, all of these are defined and they will be uh, used uh, in the algorithm. Um, also for, um, for this version, for this generalized version, uh, we have uh, shared variables between processes. We have flag, uh, but this time we have uh, two flags for each node. So we have a flag for the left process and a flag for the right one. And we also have um, we also have a weight variable for each node, which uh, can be at the left side or the right side in order to indicate which process is weighting. So um, now in order to, uh, to verify this uh, uh, algorithm, we need, to, uh, we need a formal model. So we need to specify this uh, algorithm and we do it using uh, MCRL2 language uh, which is a process algebra with data associated with a tool set for modeling and uh, simulation and verification of concurrent systems and uh, protocols. Um, so let's start uh, specifying our uh, algorithm. Now, first, we would like to, um, to, to say that we have um, specified the enter and leave of the algorithm explicitly using actions. And this is for a verification purpose. And also um, the first thing actually is also how to deal with the shared variables, flag and weight, how to specify them. So uh, for flag, for example, we, uh, for flag, for example, we introduce uh, a process equation that specifies uh, reading uh, and uh, writing uh, these variables, and uh, we specify the the process. Uh, we specify the communication between this uh, variable and uh, the process instance, and the same thing for uh, weight variables. So uh, for the for the algorithm, we actually it is um, straightforward to specify the process equation of Peterson's algorithm. Uh, so first we set the flag, and then we set the weight variable, and then we enter to a weighted loop in which we we uh, get out of it only if uh, uh, the the, the flag of the other process is false or uh, the weight variable is assigned to uh, the other process. Once we get out of this weighted loop, we uh, enter to the critical section. Uh, so if, if we are uh, in the road, of course, and then we enter to the critical section and um, leave. And then uh, if 
uh, if we are in the in the node that uh, so if we are in the road we enter to the critical section and leave otherwise we we move further in the tournament tree to the parent node so we execute peterson's algorithm again for the uh, in the parent node so uh, once we finish we reset again the flag uh, into false um actually oh, we, we uh, so we have the the specification of this algorithm and now we want to verify uh, some properties so we use mu calculus to specify properties uh, mu calculus is the, the first order model uh, the first order uh, model mu calculus is a temporal logic that extends uh, hennessy merlin Mil milner logic sorry with fixed points and and data so um, this is a mutual exclusion property that says that any at any time at most one process can be in the critical section and this is formalized by saying uh, that uh, invariantly there are no two consecutive enters uh, without an intermediate leaf so we cannot find uh, in the state space two enters without an intermediate leaf uh, action uh, so um, this property uh, is verified so using mcrl 2 to set so it is true uh, and we have another uh, Another property, which is the liveness property, starvation freedom. So if a process requests access to its critical section, then it will be able to have it in a finite number of steps. And uh, this uh, property also called lockout, eventual access or finite steps. Uh, and it is the strongest liveness property of Peterson's algorithm, as I've said. Um, yeah, so uh, it, the formula says that if process requests access to uh, the critical section, it is allowed to uh, enter uh, within a finite number of steps. So the least uh, fixed point in the formula uh, ensures uh, that after requesting the critical section, actions other than uh, enter uh, can only be taken a finite number of uh, like uh, of times before uh, enter is taken and this formula is uh, is this property is proven false and the counter example is given by mcrl22 set is the following in which we see that process zero requests access to its critical section also process one requests access uh, access but we have a cycle here in which only process two that requests access get so enter leave and then request again and enter leave an infinite number of times uh, so process zero and one we never get their chance um, in order to execute that uh, uh, counter example so let's suppose we have this tournament tree so processes zero one two are attached to their initial positions and the flag variables are all set to false and the weight variables are set to the left processes so process zero requests access to its critical section then it sets its flag to true and the weight to uh, to to zero uh, and and then process one that also sets its flag to true and the weight to one, so it requests also. Um, and then process two uh, comes and also requests. Then um, then it uh, it uh, twins the competition here in node two because there is no other uh, candidate in the right side. So it twins the competition and moves to uh, the road. And also it wins the competition in the road because there is no other competent in the left side and it gets access to its critical section. 
then it sets its flux to false again and it uh, it does the same thing uh, again and again um, and as you see process zero and one uh, for example process one can uh, can execute something and also process zero can execute something but it but they do not and the only one that uh, progresses in the tree is process uh, two so uh, for for the version of two processes this property is verified uh, and the version of two processes is executed in every uh, node so uh, for processes that are attached to the same node this problem will not uh, appear but uh, but it, yeah in this case we, we can say that uh, peterson's algorithm uh, preserves the, the individual progress of uh, processes that are attached to the same node. But the issue is that how to consider individual progress of processes that are not attached to the same node. So for for the for uh, the country example, for example, we we have we had the problem with uh, with process two that is getting uh, access every time and process zero and one uh, are waiting uh, forever for their turn. They want to get it. So, how to uh, to consider the individual progress or uh, of uh, of processes that are attached to uh, node one and process that is attached to uh, process two? So, we got expired from the counter example, and we proposed a new variation of this algorithm in which we. Uh, we propose a fair mutual exclusion algorithm for uh, more than n processes um, in order to satisfy this property. So the first thing that we have done is, uh, is specifying this uh, next variable. And this next variable help us to, uh, to introduce the the information about the other side of uh, about the other uh, processes that are not attached to the same node so process 2 should know that uh, process 0 and 1 also uh, request access to their critical section and it will it should at some point uh, the its progress should be bounded out at some point in order to give turn to the other the others to get their turn. So uh, we specify the next uh, turn uh, variable function, and we block the progress of, uh, for example, uh, process two until uh, process zero and one get their turns, and uh, we we know this from uh, their flags if they are false. Uh, so the, the main modification that we've done in the algorithm is adding this waiting loop here um, and including the parameter, uh, which is the information about the next turn. Uh, so basically, process two here, when it comes to this waiting loop, it will wait enter, until uh, process one and two get their uh, turn. And then it can uh, request again an access. So we verify the same properties for this version also to be sure that the algorithm that we proposed is correct. We verified mutual exclusion and also uh, in this version, uh, starvation freedom is, uh, is satisfied. Uh, so now we have another interesting property that we can verify, which is bounded overtaking. Uh, so the formula uh, is the following. So um, the formula says that uh, for every process i, if uh, uh, it requests access to the critical section, every entry, uh, every enter action other than enter uh, of the, the current process uh, increments the parameter n. And if um, uh, n of the, the greatest uh, fixed point, and if condition n is uh, is violated, means that uh, this condition, uh, so 
uh, if the n is uh, uh, if the b is uh, bigger than uh, n then uh, then the property is uh, false and then we find that this uh, this uh, property is also verified and the bound for three processes is uh, four um, we also verified the for um, uh, for three, four, and uh, five processes. And uh, this uh, uh, is the result of our experiment. Uh, and we use a timeout of four hours, but since the, the, the algorithm is really complex, uh, we run into state explosion problem, of course. Uh, for, uh, like you can here see the, the time, how it exploses. Uh, and for five processes, it is more than uh, four hours. So we ask the question how to compute the bound for more uh, than five processes. Um, and in this case, we, we had to give a proof, a formal proof uh, that uh, proves that the, the, the bound, there is a bound for uh, every, uh, any number of processes. And uh, the bound that we found is this one. Um, and by this, we have proven the correctness of uh, the new var variation of the algorithm. So to by this, uh, to conclude, I would like to remind what we have done in this research work. So we have specified Peterson's algorithm for more than two processes. Of course, tournament tree version using MC RAL2 language. We verified uh, properties and explain why starvation freedom is violated in this algorithm. And also we suggest a new variation uh, to consider um, the previous uh, problem. Um, so also we specified this new variation and verified it using MCRL2. And we define, since we run into state explosion problem, we define a function that computes the bound and uh, given a formula proof uh, to prove its uh, correctness. Uh, maybe there are uh, some open questions. Um, the first one is uh, how to reduce the, maybe we can propose other versions that uh, reduce the maximal uh, waiting period, this bound. And also another open question is that uh, uh, Peterson's algorithm, uh, it is known that it, it uh, sometimes, or uh, now in modern uh, architectures, it, is, uh, it fails, but uh, an open question is how to uh, implement it or how to resolve this uh, problem in these modern architectures. And this brings me to the end of my presentation and I'll be happy taking all the questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Ayusra. Um, let me see if you have some questions. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, could you give a simple example, just uh, to me, uh, for me to understand uh, what what is the application of this algorithm in engineering practice? Well, um, yeah, as I've said, uh, hello? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, because I heard myself twice. Uh, so, um, for in practice, as I've said, the Peterson's algorithm fail in modern architecture. There are other solutions, uh, hardware-based solutions, because this is a, a software-based solution. But there are some other hardware solutions that are more practical nowadays. Um, but this work can help in understanding the complexity of these kinds of algorithms and how to uh, also it is a good example to use it in order to learn how to uh, to modify algorithms in order to satisfy some requirements. Like as I as I've showed in the first uh, part of my presentation, the starvation freedom property was not verified 
and how we added this uh, uh, waiting loop in the end in order uh, and also the parameter about the next uh, process in order to uh, to reschedule uh, or to ensure the uh, the individual progress of uh, each process mm -hmm. thank you so yeah Welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and we have also two questions. Uh, you mentioned process algebras, but uh, did you consider another formal model for solving this problem? And uh, the second, uh, the second one, uh, is there any application domain where you have in mind to apply your work? Well, uh, okay, for the first question, uh, yeah, of course, there are some uh, other formal models that uh, uh, that are used in order to specify these uh, uh, algorithms and in order to uh, verify them later. So we can use, uh, for example, Petronets or uh, uh, process algebra or yeah, this, uh, this is possible and also uh, other related work uh, are already uh, in the literature uh, that specifies this algorithm um, using several uh, modeling languages. Um, I can repeat the second uh, question. Yes, I think I see it also. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So the second question is that there is uh, any application domain where you have in mind to apply your work? Well, um, in practice, this uh, algorithm can fail uh, because uh, uh, there are hardware solutions that are more adapted with, with uh, uh, modern architectures. They are more practical. Um, but um, the main uh, idea here is uh, how to show or to explain uh, the complexity of these algorithms. Because first, these algorithms are uh, known by everyone in the world uh, because they are well famous but sometimes you do not uh, understand them they are difficult to to be understood because of their complexity uh, and this can be uh, a good example uh, in order to uh, illustrate them and also to uh, to illustrate the, the problem of starvation freedom of uh, uh, this classical version of uh, Peterson and how to uh, resolve it using uh, formal methods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, this is all, I mean, questions. Uh, Yusra, thank you very much. Thank you again. And thank you for participating in our for participation in our conference. We hope to see you see in you another later. event. See yeah. you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. <clears throat>
in an online way. And then I will show some comparison between other algorithms. So first of all, about the process mining. So usually we have two steps. Uh, the first one is uh, process discovery. So basically what it does is we, we have an event log and we, we then uh, apply the mining algorithm on the event log, then generate some uh, process models. Then the second step you will do is to um, analyze the process model to determine if, it's, if there's any anomaly or it's normal. So um, in, in our paper, we, we proposed a process mining inspired technique that uh, that is a pre-processing algorithm and uh, that can be applied to the uh, network packet data and then it outputs some um, um, uh, that, and, then out, and the output can be applied uh, with uh, some classifiers for example the machine learning or uh, outlet detectors so <clears throat> Here's an example of how process mining works. So we, uh, on the left side, we have five traces or cases in process mining. And um, in total, we have seven different event classes. And uh, the event classes basically is just from A to G, uh, seven event, event classes. And uh, from these five traces, what we can get is the mode on the right-hand side. Um, this is um, mine from the fuzzy miner. Uh, but we, we haven't applied any abstraction uh, with it, so we keep everything like uh, as the initial model. Uh, what we can see here is uh, we have some uh, number on the nodes and some number on the uh, edges as well. Um, so the number on the node basically means how many times this event class happens. And the uh, number on the node, the weight on the, uh, on the edge, sorry, I mean the weight on the edge, uh, means how many transactions has happened. For example, uh, this part from A to B, we can see the um, number on the H is uh, three. So basically that means um, A to B has happened three times, as you can see in trace one, two, and uh, four. That's where it happens. So this this is basically the, the frequency it happens. Um, so here's a question. So how can we like apply the um, process mining on network traffic data, right? Um, we can, what we can do is, so with the first of all, we, we, we have to only keep the non-numerical values, the um, like events and transactions, because this is what the process mining handles. Uh, it's about processes. So we only keep non-numerical values. And at the second step, we, we, we can define, because the, basically the network data it is just a sequence of packets. Um, so packet here uh, in the notation, we, uh, we use P. So it's just a sequence of packets. And then also we know that um, some packets belong to some flows because the um, network connections is basically you know, network connections uh, between the server and the client. So we will have uh, multiple uh, network flows so each network flow is basically just one collection. So um, the flows can be converted into cases and the, 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 the set of the traces is basically the event log. It's equivalent to the event log. And we can have a look of uh, the example. So here's the example. It is a, a fragment of um, the network data we connected. Um, so as you can see in the yellow part, it's uh, some basic information about the packets, for example, like the timestamp and the IPM ports. So we can use the information from the left hand side, which is in the yellow part, uh, to reconstruct the flows or the network connections. So the and, and, and the green part, it's the attribute we, we, we kept for the process mine itself. So we only use the flags from the network header uh, like synchronize, acknowledge, something like this. So after we reconstructed the traces, we will just discard the yellow part. Um, so after the reconstruction of the trace, what we get is um, this smaller table here. We only have the flags, uh, as you can see, and the side. So the side basically means uh, where the packet is sent from. If it's C, then it's uh, coming from the client. If it's a server, then it comes from the server. We can simply like create this uh, attribute by looking at the 
IP address and the port. Uh, so we have these um, information here, then uh, that will be ready for us to for the for the uh, process mining. Um, but the, the the question is, how can we mine the like, how can we do the process mining online? Because traditionally we can we can apply process mining on the network data as I showed. Uh, the problem is usually the um, captured packet data it's huge. It, it has a lot of data, and um, for the intrusion detection perspective, we are not expecting or expect to um, do the analyze after we connect a, a large quantity of data. What we have to do is do it online. For example, for each single packet we receive, we have to determine if there is an intrusion or not. So we have to make this process mining um, online. And um, what we did is um, we applied the sliding window. And so the sign window will have a size L. And in our experiment, we used uh, 500. As you can see on the right hand side, there's a chart. And so um, we can mine a small model, relatively small model, uh, with 500 packets. And we call this uh, matrix A. Because essentially, uh, the fuzzy model itself is just a, a graph. So it's, it's just a, like, a symmetric, uh, I mean, an adjacency matrix. So um, after that, we slide the window to the right hand side and uh, we will mine another snapshot A. Um, and uh, we just repeat this until we reach the very last packet, uh, which is uh, PN. And then we will generate, uh, if we can see on the next slide. So we can generate a series of snapshot A's. And um, in these A, we have uh, six, 26 event classes used. So during our experiment, we observed um, that there will be like around 23 uh, possible headers in the network data and um, plus three like other, other tokens, start, end, and others. So the others is basically default um, event class. If we observe something that's not included, uh, in this table, some rare cases we will just classify it as uh, others. We 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 have these uh, twenty four event classes, uh, twenty six event classes. So uh, the A should be like a twenty six by twenty six adjacency matrix because um, it's a it's a um, graph. So um, that would be like twenty six by twenty six. And um, um, we also we used a state table like approach to keep the Transition of last of last tra transition uh, because um, um, usually if we only consider five hundred packets, it will be probably somewhere uh, between the start of the um, connection and end of the connection. So five hundred packets would not cover the whole network connection. That's why we have to keep the previous transition uh, to prevent the uh, prevent some information loss. And uh, also, this state table will give some uh, performance boost because, in that case, we wouldn't need to um, mine this snapshot every single time we have a new packet coming. We the only thing we have to do is we reduce one from the weight uh, from the previous um, tra transition, and we add one for the incoming transition. So we only we only keep one like snapshot in the memory, and we just like manipulate it to create this series of um, adjacency matrices. And of, of course, you know, for the uh, training uh, purpose, we have to label it. So from the IDS 2018, that's the um, data set we used, uh, that packet data set, we, we have the label data. So we know which packet is from the attacker and which is not. So if we know that this packet is from the attacker, then we will just mark it like this. So we mark this um, matrix matrix with uh, uh, some label like attack. And uh, if there's any packet that is come that is coming from uh, the attacker, we will mark this adjacent say, matrix as a uh, as attack. And then what we do is just divide by five hundred by divide by L, which is our um, third, uh, choice to normalize the uh, value. 
And uh, here we go, some output from uh, the uh, series of adjacency matrices. So as we know, we have 26 by 26. So the adjacency matrix is 26 by 26. So we expect 676 possible relations uh, or transitions. And uh, here in this chart, I only selected like 20 of them. And uh, what we can see is um, the attack for this one, uh, left side, it uh, start around uh, at around 50,000 uh, mark, this packet. And then what we can see is we can observe that once there is an attack uh, happening, the fluctuation of the output of, um, of our algorithm start to uh, stabilize. And uh, that, that definitely says that uh, we have observed something. Uh, on the right hand side, it's the same, uh, it's very similar. So um, after that, we, we applied a um, few number of different um, neural networks for, for classifier, for the um, binary classification. Um, but you know this this table is just a comparison with another um, preprocessor. It's called CSC flow meter. It's um, another preprocessor that uh, will generate some data, and then you can apply the um, like um, the classifiers on it. So our preprocessor has um, it's it's not like every every single different attack type has outperformed the CSC flow meter. But what we can see is um, it's the the performance is still um, um, like um, promising. Uh, this is for binary classification. We also did the um, anomaly-based uh, intuitive detection setup. So we have used uh, different outlier detectors like I showed in this picture. And uh, we can clearly see that our uh, preprocessor have outperformed the um, flow meter for uh, the anom anomaly-based um, setup. Um, this is the um, receiver operating characteristic, ROC. So basically, a larger the area uh, means uh, better the performance. And um, so here's the conclusion. Um, so basically, what we get from here is um, we, we, we get the promising performance, but the performance is not like completely outperform some other um, other preprocessors, but the problem is, um, the, it it depends on like how you compare things, right? And um, um, because we are doing online and like CSC flow meter, you have to wait uh, for, for the um, connection to close, and then it will generate a, a output. But our preprocessor will generate output for each single uh, packet, and that's that's the fundamental difference between uh, between the uh, between our processor and the CSC flow meter. And then this is very extensible. So basically, by, by theory, this, this would um, not only work on network data. So anything that is that can be converted to, into event flock, you can apply this algorithm, right? Like other, other type of uh, things. And also, you can, you can apply any kind of um, classifier um, to the output of this uh, algorithm. Um, that's, that's everything. Um, thank you. And, okay. Like, please, um, if you have questions. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we have some questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, what do you mean by at the pre-processing state? Uh, it was written uh, on the first slide of your presentation. Um, ah, OK. Um, so this algorithm itself, it's, uh, it's not, itself is not a uh, classifier. So it's a preprocessor. So you have this uh, network packet data, you input to this uh, preprocessor, and then this preprocessor will generate some uh, like vectors for you to be applied onto classifiers. So this, this is only a preprocessor itself. It's not a classifier. So that's why it means. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the second question, how do you segment the packets into cases and why? For example, how you say that packet number i should be in case number j? OK, and um, can I come back to the slide? Yes. So um, like, so basically, you know, when the two computers come, come like communicating, right, you have um, 
So the downstream downstream client will like send a request to the upstream server. It will use a port like this. So the source port will match the source IP. So if we know that the combination is like, well, there's one packet from this source IP from this source port to this to this combination, we know that's the same connection. Like this um, this first packet and uh, the second packet basically is, is coming back right from the from the uh, one one zero to 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 this one nine two dot dot one six eight dot ten dot five. So we know it's back and forth. As long as it's the same combination, we know it's the same um, same case, the same flow. Mm -hmm. so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so um, I don't see uh, more questions. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah. And uh, these are all presentations for today. Uh, thank you for very interesting uh, talks. Uh, for good job, <laughs> we made it. Um, and uh, see you tomorrow, please. All speakers, all participants, join us tomorrow and uh, engage in discussion and ask questions because it's uh, very important uh, to have feedback, to have some um, discussion. Yeah. Um, so um, please check uh, the links on our website and see you tomorrow. Goodbye.